You better be listening to Slezoids or I must break you. It has been written since the beginning of time that evil supernatural creatures exist in a world of darkness. And it is also said, man can call forth these powers of darkness. Those horror stories you heard about in the forest, they're true. They're all true. Officials found a camera with this film in it, but no trace of the people. We believe that there is a creature living in these mountains. And possibly a close relative to man. We're already in Bigfoot territory, where all those people were killed. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fair from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature, Grindhouse style, where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. I am pretty sure that this is happening, but next week we're going to watch Gene Wilder just kill a bunch of children in a factory. So uh, join the sleeves. It's going to be fun. What what could that be? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film uh, that we cover as well. Patreon subscribers also get an honor our shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we are coming up on like a sixth year, maybe even going into at some point a seventh year here of the show. So there's like... 150 bonus episodes as well as our bonus transmission series where we talk about uh, new release genre films um so if you haven't made the jump yet patreon.com slash slezoids podcast and speaking of which we had uh quite a few people make the jump this week we give them their shout outs here nice. um oh i need to be able to see their full names though uh we <laughs> had uh andy Gareni sign up for an entire year of the show which uh, again there's an annual tier for a little bit of a discounted rate monthly for anyone who's interested in that thanks to andy we had mr melendez sign up zegs Zone. Uh, some guys channel 12 also signed up for an entire year of the show uh we had trevor sign up we had alexander von uh Monsju signed up for a year of the show gabrielle roy um roy Petkovat. oh god uh nathan b uh crocker max moore coconut crab mario's uh <laughs> Christophides? I don't know if that's a fake name. Uh, EJ, <laughs> Diogo uh, Matos, we had Othiel, David Donahue, uh, Ereg, uh, JJ Henderson, Callum Gavin, Uberland Gisbar, Catherine Woods, and last but not least, Dustin. Uh, or Dustin in? Hmm, interesting. Um, <laughs> thanks so much to all of uh, you folks. Hope you're enjoying those uh, bonus episodes. Uh, we very much appreciate the support. Yeah, thank you very much. That's the one plug for the week. The other plug, as always, is uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you are listening on either one of those platforms, and I can see the stats, I, I know that you are. I can see you listening right now on both those platforms. Give us a good old rating and review down at the bottom there and uh, helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. We appreciate that support as well. And the very last plug, as always, is merch. If you like the poster art that based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for our show, you can get that put on basically anything that you can think of. And you freaks have thought of a lot of things. You've gotten pillows, you've gotten notebooks, you've gotten uh, hoodies, which is actually pretty normal. Um, and, and you can, and if you're interested in any of that, you can find that in uh, the link in the description below, as well as over at sleezoidspodcast.com. But that is it for the intro. Welcome back to another week. As always, I am your host, Josh Lewis. Joining me also, as always, is my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. I believe uh, two weeks uh, ago would have been the last time you folks over on the main feed uh, would have heard from us, and we would have been in the thick of noir Vember. Oh, with yeah. Our... Uh, Good uh, returning friend of the pod, uh, Casey, a.k.a. Manovsky article with uh, an episode we had been planning to do for a couple years, and we found that it was finally time to do. We did a double feature of two very uh, strange and apocalyptic nuclear anxiety fueled, you know, quasi sci fi uh, uh, crime thriller films. We did a double feature of Robert Aldrich's masterfully blunt and nasty adaptation of Mickey Spillane's pulp paperback, uh, character, uh, Mike Hammer with the film Kiss Me Deadly from 1955, which just has one of the most iconic 
uh, noir endings in, in all of yeah. movie history that uh, sparked so many uh, filmmakers' careers and feels like kind of a a, a, a a Rosetta Stone a little bit for one Mr. David Lynch. Yeah, um, total masterpiece. <laughs> Incredible movie, and we paired it with an with a, a kind of underseen, at least in the West, uh, Japanese actually kind of long and bigger budget, like <laughs> crazy, like film. just a crazy film by one uh, Kazuhiku Hasegawa. It's just a deranged genre bending mix of atomic bomb satire and like a hard boiled like cat and mouse like procedural film called The Man Who Stole the Sun from 1979, which has like some of the craziest high octane like action stunt work <laughs> that I've seen in terms of like car chases and gunfights and explosions oh, yeah. for like one big set piece, but also, you know, is about a guy just like making a nuclear bomb and holding Tokyo hostage so that the rolling stones can play in japan yeah it's it's all over the place but in the best way it really does show every detail of the bomb being made uh at one point he's even kind of like falling in love with the bomb and cuddling with it uh, japanese great, censors thought that it was too instructional yeah, yeah <laughs> when yeah, the movie it, came out <laughs> it, it really does go through like every step it's kind of unreal and uh, a great highway chase scene that everyone has to check out so highly and written by paul schrader's brother leonard yeah. schrader has even a little bit of like a quasi yeah. taxi driver thing to it like the japanese uh atomic taxi driver it's a crazy <laughs> movie yeah so absolutely. if you if you haven't heard that episode go back and listen uh two weeks ago over on the main feed with casey we had a lot of fun breaking both those down but then last week over on the Patreon feed exclusively uh, for the bonus listeners over there, we actually did the patron voted episode, which once every two months we have the patrons uh, nominate and vote for uh, the double feature that we're going to talk about. And we had one that happened to occur, occur during Noir November, so we only took Noir and Neo Noir double features. And you guys selected a corrupt cop a cab noir double feature of Orson Welles's very seedy and expressionistic vision of a dirty and uh, unjust lawman in the film Touch of Evil, 1958. Tragically, his last Hollywood uh, movie before being mm-hmm. just officially run out of town and, and entirely. And what a way to go out on! What a performance oh, to yeah. all go out on! <laughs> For that to be the one that they throw you away on is just incredible. It's it's so good. Yeah, he's he, he's too menacing, and 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 the movie is too good looking. He needs <laughs> yeah. to he needs to be kicked out of Hollywood. Um, and then the pairing was Curtis Hansen's uh, very much more slick and uh, Oscar winning, obviously pop action mm-hmm. thriller take um, on the neo noir, and also James Elroy with his adaptation of L.A. Confidential from nineteen ninety seven. Uh, which we uh, two and a half hour long neo noir star studded. You know that that was a three hour episode <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the exactly. Patreon last week. <laughs> we could not help ourselves, and it did really make me want to check out the um, the original work of L.A. Confidential uh, from El Roy, just because we, we he, you know they had to get rid of like five central characters, and I'm just curious where else that that madman goes. So, yeah, between that and uh, cop. The James B. Harris yes. film with James Woods. We've oh had a lot my. of fun talking Elroy on the show. So uh, I would recommend going back to both those episodes. Yes, definitely. Cop all timer ending. I'll just leave it at that. That's right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so if you haven't heard that episode, patreon.com slash Lizoids podcast, that was over on the, um, I just said podcast like a fucking Boston <laughs> guy. Um, that, was, that was over. Yeah. <laughs> Habit bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was that was last week over on the Patreon. But uh, moving on to this week, November is done. We're going back into regular scheduled programming, and we have a very special guest, uh, returning guest joining. Um, he is the uh, one of the co-hosts of podcast about list and also uh, monster crazy, uh, a podcast all about movie monsters and various monster uh, creations, uh, which I'm only teeing up because it's going to set up his episode perfectly here. We are talking to Cameron <laughs> Fetter. Cameron, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me back. Thanks Welcome for back. coming back. Bringing some yeah. wild ones. Yeah, and bringing yeah. monsters again. I feel like yeah. it was monsters last time too, right? We talked, we went Godzilla I'm mode. We're never going to bring you guys monsters. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. 
I love we, it. We went, I mean, I was, I was stoked. We finally got to do destroy all monsters. That one needed to get done. So mm-hmm. yeah, what I, I, I was considering when you asked me what I wanted to do this time, I was considering, you know, making you guys do some more old Godzilla stuff, but I, I this, this double feature idea tickled me too much. And I was like, no, <laughs> I, I have to do this. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm very, uh, very stoked about it. Um, so Cameron, what two films have you brought with you this week? What two monsters have you brought with you this week? And, uh, why did you pair them together? Cause I know that you actually hadn't even seen one. So you were kind of blind. You were yeah. shooting blind a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So I, I brought, um, night of the demon and night of the demon. Uh, <laughs> one of them is from 1957. The other's from 1980. I, I had seen the 1957 one before the Jacques Turner, uh, movie and I love it. So I was like, oh, I do want to talk about that. And then when I was, I had found out there was also a movie about Bigfoot called Night of the Demon that I had not seen. And I thought that would be an incredible pairing to just do another movie that has the same name as it. But it turns <laughs> out they kind of have some similar stuff going on a little bit. They're both kind of yeah. have a professor investigator guy. 100% nerdy professor stuff. against a hairy monster. Both of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which surprised me. Um, but yeah, it was fully a, a double feature built on two movies that aren't related, but have the same name. <laughs> yeah. I was originally confused when you pitched it too. Cause I was like, there's obviously the night of the demons movies as well. Which we've so covered as well. Briefly, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was a little confused. I was like, is, is, have we not done these ones? I was like, no, we haven't done these ones, but, but yeah. And I, I was, I was surprised too putting them on for the first time. Cause I was like, I know the second one's a Bigfoot one, but what's the first one? I did, for some reason it didn't include to me that like there was probably a monster in that one too. I just didn't, even think about it even though i saw that it was jacques turner and i was like you know 1940s you know b horror legend you know dead like cat people and stuff and but but, uh, but maybe also more th- psychological than an actual beast but it's also fun to see two movies that take the exact same premise professor versus you know hairy monster in some capacity <laughs> and for turners to be just have so much like hollywood kind of like class and 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 elegance to it to, to its style despite the kind of like weird fiction and satanic demon cult plotting that eventually kind of crops up in it and then the 1980s version is just like <laughs> pure video nasty porno director grindhouse yeah. slasher trash like through and through just like nonsense characters walking in a forest with waiting for Bigfoot to like tear their dick off and you know yeah. just like yeah so crazy you know. man <laughs> just, it's been so long since I've watched a movie like that I, I feel like I used to watch a bunch of them and I just haven't in a while and this one just caught me off guard by how fully just yeah disgusting it was yeah and 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 we'll get to the actual structure but how it's structured so that they can just keep getting to Bigfoot kills a lot of the time um is <laughs> w- became pretty entertaining in its own ways too so yeah this will be this will be a fun double feature I think. well yeah and and, <laughs> and and the fact that one of them is like so about just like a sense of kind of atmosphere and implication sure. and then the and the other one is like what if you saw a man in a fursuit just fucking rampage people for the almost the majority of the runtime you know yeah okay. <laughs> like just complete opposite approaches to the like literal the same log line if you were to read it out and then know? just have one of the most like <laughs> disgusting endings too uh um in the specifically in the bigfoot one i mean so it's yeah. it's yeah it's such a bizarre film and it's a hilarious pairing honestly i think this this works surprisingly well yeah so i'm uh, i'm excited to jump in into it here but i'm gonna have to clarify with the years here because <laughs> yes we're gonna we're, right. gonna we're gonna we're gonna jump in we're gonna start with night of the demon 1957 <laughs> Stick Don't on. make up your mind till you see this masterpiece of macabre magic. Because, after all, evil supernatural creatures really do exist. All right, we are talking Night of the Demon, uh, a.k.a. Curse of the Demon, as it was known uh, in, it, in its stateside release, uh, which would have actually ruined Cameron's whole whole deal if that was what the name meant. <laughs> I Stoke, know, actually. man. Yeah, they fucked but, it over. Yeah. <laughs> but it is the 1957 British supernatural creature horror film uh, directed by Jacques Turner, written by Charles Bennett, 
um, and, you know, sort of co-written a little bit by the film's producer, Hal E. Chester, who, you know, we'll get into it, kind of took the film from him, um, uh, based on the short story, Casting the Runes, by one M.R. James, and starring Dana Andrews, Peggy Cummins, and Niall uh, McGinnis. And now, I think that this actually might be our first time talking about Jock Turner, if I'm if I'm correct here. I'm, I'm going to pull this up. Gonna... Did we do Cat People? We show? did the Paul Schrader cat people. Oh, I think. we didn't do the other one. Okay. I thought so for some he, reason that was the he double. He came up in right. conversation because we were talking about a remake of one of his movies, but we haven't even done the, uh, the, the other ones either. So yeah, this is our first time yeah. talking about Jacques Turner. Well, I'm honored the, um, to, to bring it to you guys then. Hell yeah. Yeah. No, he's incredible. He's a legendary, you know, like French born Hollywood B movie filmmaker, his 1940s collaborations with, uh, RKO's horror B movie producer and maestro Val Luton, um, is, you know, it, it is the thing of legend. It's a run that included cat people, uh, the leopard, the seventh victim, my personal favorite. I walk with a zombie from yeah, 1943. Really good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, he did these very Gothic horror suspense melodramas that were just known for these like unbelievably stark and, and vivid visual styles really emphasize the power of you know kind of ominous mood and and suggestion over necessarily seeing things and uh famously the use of like you know like the stalker shadows like in the pool yeah. scene in cat people or like the unsettling and dreamy sort of like atmosphere of of i walk with a zombie when it's indulging in like the colonial horror sort of like ghost story elements of characters just like walking around a decaying property and like uh you know the, the elemental images of them walking through the tropics and you know or or there's a great uh, lyric cut in that of like a match cut of like a guy you know about to like stab a, a, a doll uh with like an arrow and it cuts to like the arrow sticking through the like saint sebastian statue like that was his thing mm-hmm. if you could find a way to get your brain to be like conjure up something more gruesome than he's actually showing you that was his kind of lyrical kind of playful f- formal style um that he had and he was also quite intelligent with how that then translated into ideas doing things like Cat people has this kind of perversely sort of like sexually motivated monster metaphor to it that we definitely talked about when Paul Schrader took it on because we were like, Paul Schrader really was like, how do I update this like 1940s idea of like being scared of women's sexuality for like the MTV (laughs) era? Just an insane idea. Um, That's the one where he fell uh, in love with the star, I believe, too, right? Yeah, and she was like, Paul, I fuck all my directors. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, just Paul. one of those great Hollywood legend stories. Um, <laughs> but uh, but but same too. I walked with a zombie. There's the kind of Haitian voodoo sort of plantation slavery history elements, which he actually turns into like a, you know, a psychological reckoning with like the past or like the living dead. And, you know, that's almost like a Henry James like zombie novel is kind of how that movie kind of plays at a, at, at a certain point. And yeah, he was just like an incredible filmmaker. And he had an incredible string of very cheap successes that he turned into a career making everything from West westerns to comedies to thrillers fucking pirate adventure movies like you name it the guy made everything um uh though probably most successful outside of horror it was really just noir um out of the Mm -hmm. past from 1947 with robert mitchum and kirk douglas you know just a stone cold feel bad romance (laughs) tragedy you know just one 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 of the greatest um and uh what's, what's the other one um nightfall uh 1956 which is you know one of the more of those like it's it's good. It's one of those more like ruthlessly kind of a, efficient noirs, though. Like it's more of like one of those like on the run kind of like fugitive ones. And okay. I think it was seen as like at the time a bit of a minor comeback for him after making some more questionable uh, choices since making a name for himself in 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 horror. Which which brings us into. Um, night of the demon here because it came out actually right after nightfall and nightfall was part of the reason that he got uh, chosen for this. I think it was kind of like, you know, this guy has moved away from the B horror for a while and it was like, can we bring him back in? You you can't really see it, but I was doing that, doing the Al Pacino, you know, (laughs) they they brought me back in, you know, like, so that's a, that ultimately, that was what I think producer Hallie Chester and screenwriter uh, Charles Bennett here were interested in bringing him back. They were like, we kind of have this, you know, cheaply made little monster short story adaptation. What would that look like if you had someone who could really skillfully 
you know, bring bring back that Val Luton era energy, give them some expressionism and suspense craft. And, you know, they were like, by all means, uh, I guess those guys didn't agree on anything about this movie, except for they both kind of liked Turner as a, <laughs> as a, as a director. But everything else about this movie, I'm sure both of you guys probably read about it, too. These these this producer and writer did not get along like at all. Yeah, it seemed yeah. like Turner <laughs> specifically wanted um it to be a little bit more ambiguous on the actual demon itself, uh, which I found kind of peculiar, just maybe given the version that we have now and that we've seen, just because it seems like the audience knowing that the demon is real and we've already seen it on screen in pretty incredible detail, that it, that you watching this professor eventually be kind of, um, or doctor be kind of arrogant about it the whole time is, is part of that, that journey. A little bit and kind of the, it's like part of the uh, it, you're almost frustrated watching the, the lead character of Holden uh, going through it because we're, we've already established the truth. And he's on he's just completely on um, he's relentless with his uh, with his with his. Well, um, you have to consider Turner is a, cl- a classy Frenchman. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. In, yeah. In, in in spirit, right. you know, and like, and I guess he, like, was, he you maybe considered show the monster. What, what right. do you mean? You cannot show. Yeah. That. <laughs> it's almost considered like a B side thing that's tasteless in a way. You know, it's got to yeah. be a little bit. More. I do. Yeah. I guess I I, I can understand. I, I feel like I, I can imagine a version of this where they don't show the monster that could be pretty incredible. Like, I mean, yeah, just again, thinking about how good Jacques Turner is at this, that type of thing, like in, in cat people and stuff, that pool scene is so insane. And I can mm-hmm. just imagine, you know, somebody running through the forest and you never see the demon and it's probably just as scary. But on the other hand, I am really grateful that the, the monster is pretty fucking cool. Put, put the demon in. <laughs> yeah. This is one of the coolest monsters in a movie ever. I think it's so. I love the effects on that demon. They are mm-hmm. like I think they're incredible for this era and and just in general. Like they still honestly look scary to me. The way that the demon like reaches its hand out at the screen yeah. and it kind of like distorts a little bit is really insane looking. And it I, is, love- I think it really is so great. I love the evolution of it too. Like the way it starts with just kind of this, um, it's like a smoke that just keeps growing and growing and growing like this, this ball of energy. Um, it almost looks like you can't really tell if it's like fire or smoke because of the black and white, but it gives this kind of uncanny look to it. Um, and it just grows and grows and grows until finally the demon appears from it. It's almost like it's coming out of another dimension or something like that. And I really, I like the evolution of its, of its look. It's very cool. Yeah, I mean it look it looks great. It's also I think it's, I think it's great that the movie basically opens with the most insane demon scene too where it like kind of yeah like spawns in from a ball of smoke and then mm-hmm. causes a big car crash with like a telephone pole falling over just like a big spectacle because I feel like it really mm-hmm. just like it just locks you in completely. Like the first time I saw this I was like, "Oh my god." Like I, yeah, I it's need a to really great next. cold open. It's a really great cold open. It really sets you in for you know what 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 you're what you're gonna get into, and and you can see how it was like sort of a cynical producer's note. And and I will say there's a lot of things about this you know sort of like child actor turned producer um, Chester where he was getting in a lot of disagreements with the creatives on it. Like not just Turner with the guy who wrote the original screenplay Bennett, who's the one who actually mm-hmm. bought the rights to the short story and sold the script to him and everything. I did he also hear got at one into point fights with were, like di- Sorry, oh, I, I just real briefly, I did hear at one point that there was one of the actresses was like, just let the director direct the movie or I'm gonna No, D- Dana Andrews. Dana Andrews, oh, the, okay. the, the 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 main actor. Yeah, at one point okay. Turner. It was it was during one of the the, the scenes when the, the cyclone hits and they're like really mm-hmm. blowing shit around. And I think mm-hmm. Turner had an idea to like bring in like bigger fans so that you know he wanted to, you know, and he was like, <laughs> he you know, to I bring wanted in like to motor look. like airplane engines or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that that was when uh, Dana Andrews had to be like go to the producer and say like I we brought this guy in to fucking direct the movie like let him make the directing decisions like what the fuck are you doing so and and, yeah. and I gotta say too Bennett like this this guy who uh, wrote the original version of the screenplay Charles Bennett like to tell this guy that he like doesn't know how to write like a like a thriller film and be like I'm gonna like page one rewrite most of your film I was like this is the guy who co-wrote for like Hitchcock yeah. for like his entire 1930s output like 39 steps 
a foreign correspondent, the man who know who knew too much. And, you know, and so to just like buy his script and then ignore his notes for the rest of production and mm-hmm. <laughs> just be like, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to do this all my way. And we, I'm going to work with the director that you kind of suggested, but you know, we'll, we'll kind of go from there, but there's, there's so much, I think just good. There's a good sort of foundation to this whole thing that really works for everyone. You have Turner going off. You have Bennett, who's very clearly interested in this uh, antiquarian ghost story uh, that that he bought the rights to, which is um, by this author named, this British author named M. M. R. James, who is considered kind of like one of the godfathers of the sort of antiquarian ghost story. And his his whole deal, once you once I read about a couple log lines from a, a bunch of his stories, I was like, this guy wrote like the same story. It's like all his story. You know, it's like it, every single one in some capacity was like a gentleman scholar who like discovers like an old thing like an old book or something and he's in like a deserted you know town on the edge of the world and he summons like an ancient supernatural evil using using the book or something like that and and I, mm-hmm. I guess in comparison to like the more gothic authors before him someone like Poe or something he was you know he he liked the malevolent mood of it but he was very much like what if it was also creepy because it was kind of a contemporary procedural? Like what if the main right. guy was, you know, an academic who was, you know, really looking into this stuff and he didn't believe in old fairy tales and all of this. And then the physical manifestations kind of happened anyway, in the face of these kind of modern, you know, kind of skeptical ordinary characters. And then, and then they got Does, mutilated by it and, and stuff like that. So if Lovecraft you consider like, that a lot too, Except he, I think he yes. specifically does detectives, uh, mostly, if I'm not mistaken. Like, I think Call of Cthulhu which, is Which I detective. would say, functionally, the professor is used as a detective in this movie. <laughs> true. true. Yeah, 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 yeah def- true. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but 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 yeah. So like, there's a really good base for like a really creepy story there, you know, and Mm -hmm. you know, of of a rational character being faced with just like this, you know, this this overwhelmingly, you know, you know, I get you know, mystical kind of thing, an an irrational thing that doesn't make sense, and how do you explain it? And and so on a certain level, that's where I kind of understand why. Bennett and Turner liked the more ambiguous version because they wanted to be like, you know, what if, you know, do we take something away by making it such a physically tangible thing? This, this sort of like, you know, this, this sort of psychological reckoning that this character is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, but at the same time, you know, Lovecraft showed the monsters too sometimes. And sometimes it's cool to get to the end and be like, no, yeah, he was, he was wrong the whole time. There's a big fucking monster. And maybe that's (laughs) what they needed to do. We'll get to it when we get to the specific sequencing, but yeah, maybe they just needed to like, save it and just have it I, show up at the end and be like, Oh fuck, you know, this yeah. whole time I you were think, like, is it's like a will they, won't they with, is there going to be a giant monster that fucking kills people? And it's like, well, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. So it does. <laughs> like I said in the intro, it does kind of make it. So since we already have established as a monster, there's much more arrogance to be taken from his character as he moves along. And I, was gonna, I think there's a, it's a but, lot. I think the movie is accidentally a lot funnier too. Yeah, in a you're way, just yeah. kind of like, dude, what are you like? <laughs> dude, there's yeah. a fucking monster. No bro, matter what, what gets about, in front of his <laughs> face, he's just like, no, fuck that. It, 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 it can be very funny. And again, like frustrating to watch at a certain point. Uh, but, but in a way that I think it still fits the, the character and the way the story's uh, moving along. But I, I do think it's a smart idea that they only do it, and, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think they only do it in that intro scene, and then they do it at the very end when he's finally yeah, kind of yeah. seen it's, it. It's just completely like a, Kind of bookended, like an, yeah. an invisible part with it, too. But yeah, you only actually see the demon. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, when he's getting chased by the... Yeah. Just, which the right. and he sees that smoke orb kind of thing, but it never fully forms, I believe. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I, f- but, I feel like I, I, I really like it being at the beginning and the end. Like, I, I feel mm-hmm. like I, I just love the demon so much that when I see it at the beginning, I'm like, it just makes me excited to see it again the entire yeah. time, which I feel like is the exact strategy that like a much lesser movie would use. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of like just a really just dog shit, low budget, like <laughs> CGI monster movie. You know what I mean? They're going to show right. that monster right at the beginning and then right at the end. And that's all you're going to get. Well, cause that's such a producer's note middle, of you got to yeah. hook them. You exactly. got to get them in. <laughs> yeah. And like, but uh, that just what, it, what's in between is just also so good that it's kind of just like a cherry on top. You know what I mean? Yeah. It feels like, it's like already a producer such a full, made one yeah. good decision and then let 
a Turner do all the other great stuff that's in here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, well because yeah. it, it, it becomes more cynical if you don't get hooked by the stuff in the middle. Right. It's just like, oh, I'm just yeah. watching this because now I'm waiting. I'm sitting through shitty shit waiting for the good shit to come back. Right. But the fact it doesn't that, take that, you know, in the middle at all, you know, Turner is he's fucking he's fucking good at scenes of people just fucking walking around rooms and being scared, yeah. which is oh, like incredible. exactly the kind of atmosphere Dude, they're, that, that they're hotel for hallway here. sequence. Yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, my God. Just the, just, the simple, ju- just in the uh, way he shoots it, like it's amazing. Yeah, the simple thought of just having the the door slightly open enough so they have these like slits of light, kind of making this crisscross maze that he's looking down. It just looks ominous. It, he's already kind of it, it, he's you know he's still denying it, but there's a mo- that I think that's the moment where he might have just seen the orb or he had some type of creepy interaction there where you you start to think that maybe he's starting to believe he, he he fights it the whole time of course but there's just these things that he does through these um these scenes of and there's these implications of him being actually scared and nervous despite him putting up a front yeah yeah well and and, and i i do like the idea of i mean like i'm a huge fan of the x-files so like sure. the, the idea of a, of a character that you're kind of grounded with in this case you know this very skeptical rational american professor john holden who's played by dana andrews who's we previously mentioned he's very good as uh one of the innocent hanged men in uh the oxbow incident and um mm. also this uh really good slimy drifter hustler in the uh, movie fallen angel um as as well and he he has a bit of a weird energy for a leading man where he he kind of can he's good at being able to play someone who's actually kind of unlikable but still yeah. you know has a little bit of that like in the moment charm and in in this case you know he is up against every other character is like a little bit more suspicious or a little bit more open to the idea of there being, you know, this kind of other beyond world of, of some kind. And he's traveling to London for a conference literally on paranormal psychology, um, only to discover that, you know, uh, his, his colleague there, Dr. Harrington, who he was supposed to meet, uh, was killed in a freak power line electrocution (laughs) accident (laughs) the day before, which is, (laughs) Which is which is what we see in that really great hold uh, cold open, which is like Harrington, like driving around the loomingly large estate of this uh, doctor, doctor, doctor Julian Carswell, played by Niall um, McGinnis, uh, who we'll talk Um, about as like, you know, there's a little you got a little bit of cult cult satanic cult stuff going. You can tell right away. He's got the fucking devil worshiper beard on. I was like, literally, no (laughs) man has ever rocked this and not worship Satan before. I love I love how also it's yeah, the guys he's his colleague dies in like yeah a freak telephone wire like electric just the craziest thing of all time and he's walking <laughs> around being like yeah it was an accident and then they meet up with uh with do- the dr carswell who is so obviously evil and they're like talk <laughs> and then dr carswell carswell is like i was so sorry to hear about the accident i I certainly didn't see him the night of and there was no like fucking hairy clawed fucking demon monster who was you know swiping at the camera that night for sure um (laughs) and and you know from from there holden is you know most of the movie is him investigating this mysterious death death alongside uh harrington's uh sort of like feisty psychologist niece uh joanna played by uh peggy cummins and so together those two have no respect for whatsoever no yeah (laughs) no a a woman in psychology are you fucking kidding me (laughs) he spends the whole time fighting no wonder we're fucking looking into satanic cults and curses and demons only fucking ladies believe in this shit this witch witchcraft going on and i mean it's very Um, funny the way that they even opened the way that they're gonna meet because he's such a dickhead right away where he's got his you know he's got his seat full back in the airplane his hat on his face and he's just annoyed every single time she's trying to slightly move the chair because it's very much in her way um he just right away they make him completely unlikable and her very sweet and intelligent and I, I find that dynamic to be very funny uh, to still focus on holden although she gets plenty of screen time too because they're mostly together uh, in this film uh figuring it out um, well, yeah, it, it seems time, like they're but. trying to pi- to pitch them as kind of like a little bit of like those old school like screwball romantic comedy. Yeah, like where here's not, these two they don't characters, work at first, opposites attract, it. you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it never fully <laughs> realizes that at all in any um, like. Yeah, it doesn't do it to the extent that I think other films usually do it. I still feel like there's a lot of uh, 
a tension between the two, even given what they do at the end and all. Of well, because that. he's just so stubborn. He's like, yeah, I'm not exactly. willing to be persuaded <laughs> by this witchcraft and, and devil story. Like even his colleagues are like, yo, check out this like crude picture of a medieval fire demon that this fucking like unconscious <laughs> yeah. farmer drew. And he says, who says he's like a former member of like a cult. He's just like, I don't fucking what, what, who cares what that is? You know, I don't give a shit. You know? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah he doesn't even have like an argument most of the time. He's just like, Oh, whatever. Like it, just shut up. I don't want to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that is that is what's uh, hilarious about it. you. Think that he really? It's just the the thing that comes from him having his. Um, I guess he's he's a doctor, so everything has to be rooted in science. But there aren't a lot of scenes where he's like you said using those arguments against them. It is just just complete blinders, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and 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 it's increasingly funny because the opening scene that the producer put in was. You know, like what was a fucking steam powered rubber fucking kaiju just fucking yeah. rampaging through a forest and going right after a guy. And, and you even know, having so they, the they, Stonehenge they, thing where they're just like demons yes. exist. We're going to tell you that right away. <laughs> yeah. the narrator this straight is up telling the opening you that dialogue. The demons yeah. exist. <laughs> like, it's like, Supernatural creatures <laughs> are literally out in the world in the <laughs> darkness <laughs> and magic powers and ruins and all people of this stuff. People are dying. That, people are worshiping them. Hell it's is all real, happening. by the way. Yeah. You know. And then that, yeah, that that insane music that starts playing too. Oh it's, yeah. It hits yeah. Hard. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Um, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The so they, so, they, so they, they show it you all. it's real capable of mauling someone to death right in front of our eyes. And, and, you know, I, I, I guess it is supposed to, supposed to make us kind of worry that, you mm-hmm. know, our cynical, skeptical, rational protagonist is walking into this thing, like not, not prepared for it, but it, it really does, does make just feel... make him come off as like a pretentious asshole where he's like, no, I'm a modern enlightened man. I believe in reason and science. And, you know, yeah. I don't believe in fairy tales or fucking any sort of like love crafty and fucking monsters yeah. and weird fiction shit, even though he has and obviously found himself in one of those stories, like through, and he's through. the type of character where if he was in a movie that came out today, he would a hundred percent be eaten 75% <laughs> of the way through the movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah absolutely. he would not survive this movie. <laughs> he, he does make you feel like oddly doomed the whole time because you've already seen the demon. You know that there's this, I don't know this cult, or at least this man is is in some way possessing the demon's power, or or seems to have some type of control over what's happening, and he's just refuses to really look into it. So as an audience member, you are kind of looking at it like, if this demon is capable of this power, this guy is not the one to help, and he's our star. He's the one we're following the entire time, <laughs> and he's refusing to actually solve this issue. And so that it, it does give you a sense of like doom a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's kind well, of ironic. And, and, and it's that, kind of and, funny, but yeah. Yeah, well, and it, it, it does create this really cool dynamic where it's it's both like sort of almost like a proto hammer film when they would mm-hmm. have like an American guy go into like a British castle and it's like, oh, my God, is there a Dracula in here? And yeah. so it's, it's got a little bit of that energy, but then it also has, you know, the, the sort of detective aspect, the kind of superstition, the sort of, in, you know, the more, you yeah. know, the, the insecurity of his perspective actually does kind of get captured in, in Turner's filmmaking when he does start to become fearful and kind of parallel. And, and that's where it kind of gave me a little bit of like what I like about the X-Files, which is when you do get like, you know, a character who is so firm against their beliefs and then they see something incredible. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately what this movie is kind of built, you know, going to yeah. build to, uh, but by the end, which is why I do think it, it, it ultimately works. And which is why I think that even if they never made the choice to show the monster at the beginning, showing the monster at the end, I think was a, you know, a really great idea where, yeah. you know, he, they, they try to maintain skepticism and kind of ambiguity. And maybe we had a little bit more, we identified with the protagonist a little bit more, not knowing that the monster attacked his friend in the opening scene. And you and, could um, technically argue that in a, in a way you could still kind of establish that thought of the demon is real within the audience by not showing it because they have that just blatant narration at the Stonehenge. A little in the bit beginning. more mystery to but, it. Yeah. But I, once again, I still think it works. I really do like that. The, the tangible shock you. of the sequence itself is still pretty yeah. good. So like, I'm not yeah, going to complain yeah. too hard about it. Like it's, it's actually a fun but little I see both um, ways. sequence. It is just funny what it does to this character that it reveals <laughs> yes. him to, him to be so <laughs> stubborn and so stupid, even though he's supposed to be coming from such a, you know, a, a sort of rational sort of like intellectual mm-hmm. uh, kind of uh, perspective. Uh, but, but the thing that really works for this, I think is again, that Turner does have the filmmaking confront him as a character. And it, the, the, the stuff mm-hmm. that makes this really cool 
is, you know, not just the characters pushing back against him, like Joanna, who is like actually does believe her uncle was murdered and, you know, thinks that actually being as skeptical as he is, is actually kind of naive. I like that little uh, line she gets about like, you know, we could learn from, from children. Like we, they believe in things in the dark and we told them not to do that anymore. But like, you know, maybe, maybe there's some merit to doing that sometimes. And that, that feels Mm. like a kind of a creative statement for the rest of the movie, because when he does start to grow, um, suspicious, like the vibes are just, they, they are incredible. And they reminded me very much of one of my favorite Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, uh, Edgar G. Almer's, uh, the black cat from 1934, just Mm -hmm. in terms of the way that it uses like architecture and space and kind of background information, like over looming statues of the lavish estate or simply him walking through a massive library or a a conference room or a train station or the hotel hall. The production design here is by the regular, uh, bond movie set maker, Ken Adams. Um, Mm. and And they use a lot of real locations too, which is just great. They look amazing. That library is incredible. it's great, and the way the camera moves through it, the the uh, unbearable slowness of it at times, the use mm-hmm. of shadow, the use of just like anticipation, it really is like you feel that there is some sort of subterranean secret or like a yeah. you know something this sort of metaphysical menacing quality that is about to jump out of the dark and kind of grab you at any moment, yeah. and you know that that ultimately is what really pushes this character through you know the most of the story that we actually see them um, go. through through because it hears such like you know i'm firm in my beliefs but everything about just the space that i'm in challenges that and yeah. turner's filmmaking is what really kind of takes that aspect to the next level the atmosphere just really is so like strong and just like just complete yeah completely seeping through every second of it and the the thing that happens a few times where that's like i don't even know what the effect is that they're doing i don't know if it's some kind of projection or what but or like or something that they're doing with the actual film, but like where it kind of like shimmers. Do you know what I'm talking about? Almost like the scene where Carswell is like, yeah, like Carswell's walking yeah. away out through a hallway in the library and the whole screen kind of like shakes and warps a little bit and happens again when he's with that group of, of people. Like it, yeah. it really just, yeah, feels like something is, is like happening. You know, it really, it, do, it does, it, it, it does feel like just the, the, the haunted atmosphere is kind of just bubbling up and, and freaking out. And it does, do such a good job of making this this really rational stubborn rude guy seem really paranoid and like lost in the deep end a little bit yeah, yeah. even even though there's part of you that kind of go like dude this guy's fucking creepy as fuck like what do you like he's you, you yeah, don't yeah. even need turner to be there to be like check out this crazy atmosphere it's just like <laughs> you know like he is like even just like that sequence of him stalking him to like the british museum library and offering him access to borrow his personal copy of all the black magic books which have mysteriously <laughs> been misplaced by the library yeah, he's like <laughs> by the way i have these copies and you could come read them at my <laughs> and, and he hands this him like a after he's told to that this is the only 400 year old copy left and it's not it's not in the restriction section anymore and then he's like come to my personal library so it is it is funny sometimes how he just like yeah. ignores little certain yeah small well he details. literally he literally even said holden literally even goes oh so i guess there was another copy yeah he doesn't, he doesn't go oh, man things. someone stole that copy to hide yeah. this shit no it doesn't even occur to him <laughs> and there is mo- like it feels like a lot of the time that it is truly just his arrogance because there's another moment where he looks at the business card that he's given and he sees like these, this extra writing on it and then when someone set, confirms to him that that's not there he's just like oh okay never mind then just just ignore it keep beelining <laughs> towards the end the finish line whatever that may be I also do like the uncanny um, feeling that w- with um, kind of the mixture of his shot that you were talking about where it's a warped shot of uh, the um, uh, uh, Carswell and it goes back to him looking at it from the library. Just because of the warped shot, it, it looks as if he's not in the library hallway anymore, really. And so he's almost oh, looking yeah, the, at the, him the, the one where it's like he's going hallway. down like the tunnel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it just yeah, feels disconnected from the actual location that he's looking at him in, and that is kind of terrifying too. So yeah, I love his his control of atmosphere is truly unbelievable. It's so good. Yeah, well, and, and the guy who plays Carswell, uh, Niall, Niall McGuinness, uh, his his performance is so 
uh, so good and so strange oh, yeah. when when <laughs> when he you know he he really does play him like a like a weird like vaudeville magician kind of character yes. who, yeah that's the way oh, he kind of yeah. to him <laughs> i love how it, the movie opens with him just like kind of passively shuffling a deck of cards like such a bizarre <laughs> a char- like th- that's just a thing that nobody would ever be doing that's not even like nece- that's not a satanist thing but it's just a thing that you see somebody doing that with that beard and you're like oh this guy has bad news like so something is up here yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah but, but but he still kind of like has a little bit of an affable presence to him like the like the whole sequence when he's like dressed like a clown and it's revealed that he's like living with his mother mother and he's like entertaining this like children's birthday party yeah and and it's just it's such a bizarre and he's just like oh look this guy's normal what do you mean this guy's yeah. not creepy and i'm like what the fuck is going on yeah, this like this guy is like for that magicians are evil for sure he yeah. mentions yeah. <laughs> that he was gonna he, he used to do it for a living i believe before whatever spirit he found for his power <laughs> you know yeah which is how he did evil. the card trick because that's what he's saying it's a che- it's a little it's a cheap yeah, halloween yeah. trick it's not an actually mm-hmm. cursed object you know this guy's not having conversations about it with his mother about how he serves satan for the economic status that it brings them <laughs> you know like i think <laughs> also, a very I'm successful pretty, magician i think that this movie is pre <laughs> is pre creepy clown also which is fun that yeah. like that yeah that that they can see him dressed as a clown and not be like okay we have to this kill this guy terrifying. Right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> just be like oh he's hanging out with kids that's nice that's true oh, that's, that's like yeah you yeah. can't after gacy you just can't do it anymore it's just yeah, not, yeah. It's, it's all creepy <laughs> yeah just just him and like 50 children and nobody else yeah. are, are there and then yeah and then the, and the mother is just like he really loves children he should yeah. get married someday you know and you're like dude she's calling him out so, yeah. and everything she said he, he should get married someday but he's too fussy yeah something like, like yeah. some insane thing like that Oh my god! Yeah, such a such a strange <laughs> um, character, and I I do like his little monologue that feels like kind of like the other kind of moment in the film that really gives away you know what it what it's trying to do, which is the um, you know at, where where the the professor straight up asks him like if he actually believes in 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 witchcraft or like hexes or curses or you know all the all this kind of stuff, and um, he uh you know he can tell that the professor thinks of all this as like imaginary that it's like a you know it's a it's a it's a witches in a in an old book or something like that and uh his his sort of comeback to that is you know where does imagination and reality begin like what is this like twilight half world you know kind of kind of thing and you know what what if the the powers of darkness and the powers of the mind are sort of similar and you know mm-hmm. which is very much getting into turner's whole thing or is is this guy psychologically convincing himself that there is something there or is there actually something there and the, the push and pull is i think designed to be you know so felt in the sequences which is i guess why they they were annoyed at the producer for being like well no we we know the whole time he's fucking there. There's a there's yeah. a there, there's a there's a, there's a, there's a monster. Well, and also Carswell does a couple things where obviously he's trying to prove his um his sense of belief and in his in his powers and everything like that too. When he does start the you know the wind blowing uh, right. with the cyclones, which Jamie you he, were right, I, I see it in my notes here. He did actually end up using plane engines to do it. So it's just like <laughs> fucking. You just get Dana wild. Andrews and Niall McGuinness just both just getting fucking rocked by plane engines in, <laughs> yeah. in the, on, on, on his lavish property in, in that scene. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, I do also like because this kind of ties to the the end a little bit because you you almost assume at this point that just given what we've seen with Kurzweil that he, he has control over the demon in some way or has this kind of um, th- this power where he feels maybe equal to it or just not not as terrified as everybody else is. Um, and he says something like, um, "Actually, having a demon here wouldn't be good for anyone; that it would tear them to shreds, like everybody." Um, and it kind of connects to the end where eventually you find out that he is a little bit terrified of it and when he you know i don't want to spoil too much but but holden uses that against him eventually and he also uses the same thing against him that they set up in the library where he does that thing where he you know drops the papers and gives it back to him and then we we find out exactly what he's transferring to him uh, a little later on yeah most um, of this movie is actually about a cursed piece of parchment that yes. everyone <laughs> basically just goes tag yeah. you're it with it is like the majority <laughs> of what these 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 characters are uh, dealing with but i but i do like your point 
because the, the, he is scared too. He reveals at one point that it's like, you know, we're doing this, the economic status with, with, with my, with my, for my mother and, and mm-hmm. for our life and everything. And at the same time, if I wasn't the one passing the parchment and the demon off to other people, then it would come for me. Yes. So like he kind of views it as a little bit of like a delaying tactic as well as, um, you know, as, as, as well as something that, um, and I suppose en- enriches his- him. Yes, and I suppose his knowledge of it too, because you know, if if he is secretly transferring this this to people so that he can keep his wealth and and um, <clears throat> and not be killed himself, he has to rely on the fact that people aren't going to figure out how to give it back to him. Uh, and that's essentially kind of like what you're watching Holden do. It just takes him quite a while. <laughs> Well, yeah, but fucking Holden, he literally scoffs in his face. Like, he's literally yeah. like, oh, yeah. yeah, so you're going to die in three days at 10 p.m., by the way. And he's just like, this is all harmless fakery. You know, yeah, this is just a, you know, this is all yeah. the, a, a little scare show to manipulate me into doing what I want. Even though, like, the whole thing is, he's just like, don't investigate my cult. Right. That's the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he also, and, yeah, the crazy thing is Holden is like fully. I feel like he's acting like he's he's dealt with this before. Like he's <laughs> like he really is acting like he's like a grizzled like detective or something. Yeah. Like, yes. I, it's so True. weird. It just is being that. like, yeah, I don't even care. I don't even I'm not even I don't even care that you're basically threatening me regardless of the supernatural parchment or whatever it is. You're telling me I'm going to die in three days and I'm, I don't care, man. Yeah. Yeah. Because like yeah. any other normal person given you know you, you you might resist it a little bit but there's there's something about that that is instantly ominous and he is just truly and I, you know i guess i've said it a few times but he's just truly one of the most arrogant characters that i've ever seen <laughs> being a leading man in one of these films and it's it's yeah. it's very interesting it's it's very I, strange it does it does make it though like i feel like it gives it so much more impact than when the atmosphere mm-hmm. does start to encroach on the scenes where he's getting like you know stalked through carswell's house or like mm-hmm. this crazy storm is coming because the the you know the text of the of the movie is fully or at least for the text of the character is that he is fully like yeah i don't believe in this stuff it's not real i'm not even scared but i feel like you can just like totally Totally feel it come apart at the seams just through the visuals uh, yeah. without even having anybody like w- barely having any, anybody say anything about it. You can just kind of feel him starting to unravel a little bit and it yeah. just makes it so effective with. Yeah, how, there's like a, like it's, it's slowly yeah. introduced. It's like him, you know, whistling that little like devil folk tune melody to himself or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. some of the little details like his desk calendar has his day ripped out after the 28th. Yeah. He's like, he's like, ooh, like, I guess I'm going to die then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but or, inside he's probably like crying a little. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, like I, the later, I feel dying. like the the further it gets into the movie the more of his stubbornness starts to come off like he is just like trying to convince himself almost yeah yeah i, I yeah well I, and, I totally and also put down anyone who like does believe in it you know like joanna mm-hmm. constantly being like you know here's a a frightful demon poem my father underlined by the way and here's him or my uncle he's like here and here's him writing in his diary about his missing calendar days have you ever <laughs> heard of this you know and he and his calendar days also said that he would die and he did die <laughs> and you know and here's his talking about a parchment and like runic symbols and all of this and and he's just going you know you want to make out you know you know like yeah, yeah you, just you, drunk you, and just barely paying attention <laughs> yeah he, he doesn't give a fuck in that scene and she he, is so he, like he, that, that, that whole that whole seance sequence when the you know the one guy mm-hmm. is like speaking in like various dead voices in like a trance and he's literally doing the, the voice of like a little child or like doing the voice of like the uncle and like warning them about you know all this happening and he's just like the guy's an impressionist you know yeah. what you know this is all stage it's all fake everyone's just being hysterical you know like none of this none of this um Matt matters and he has a great line in here too at one point that really speaks to again just Jamie how arrogant he is the yeah. it would be easier to stop Carswell's demon than a woman who has her mind made up at one point he says to Joanne right, right. <laughs> you're like dude there's just you so, can't so at a certain point he's just going along with it to humor her and he's just mm-hmm. like you know I don't you know I don't give a shit about any of this but but it, it, it is true when he eventually does actually investigate it and it turns into like you know Jacques Turner's you know what he's just a master at that wonderfully moody little sequence when he's descending down the steps and the doors are opening behind them and shining Mm -hmm. light in. And my favorite uh, shot is um, that hand in the foreground that grabs the banister 
that yeah, he doesn't yeah. see just as the music swells just a great perspective shot just a great like moment that's c- completely for us and not for him you know and um and the way the house almost just visually does turn into like a little bit of a of, of a labyrinth and you know mm-hmm. and, and it becomes it feels more hostile even the house cat at one point turns into a fucking jaguar that he starts physically <laughs> yeah. fighting with which i was like that's the cat people man yeah. there he is <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> And even then, he's he's still kind of like he has that moment, uh, and he fights the, the the leopard off for a little while, and then uh, <laughs> Carswell comes in because assuming that he hasn't been following him and he's just heard the commotion or whatever it is, and it turns into a, a cat again, and he's just kind of like he says something like, uh, um, "It's a, it's a it's a lesser demon that has been sent to protect this room," and you you know it, there's kind of like an irony to it of what he's saying, but since we've seen what we've seen and, and, and you actually do see Holden react to the transformation, which is interesting too. Um, but still Holden afterwards just kind of denies it again and it keeps the blinders on at least a little bit. He's like, uh, well, that was fucking weird. He turned yeah. the lights on. It was just a fucking cat again. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a leopard. What a, what, what a, what a great Halloween trick joke, yes. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, that, that's an interesting one too. When he goes to the police station, because initially when he goes, it's because he's, become at least in that moment somewhat convinced that it is going to happen and then yeah. again he just he lets that fucking he tells the story to over. the cops and he's like dude i'm fucking i'm an idiot listen to myself this is a <laughs> stupid story what am yeah. i talking about <laughs> and it's funny that i do like the thought of him saying all this causing this commotion in the station and then he's just like uh you know what never mind halloween prank we're leaving <laughs> just forget any report i just said even any of this nonsense Carswell's just really good practical Joker, which is exactly. true about a lot of great horror villains, honestly. True. <laughs> yeah. um, Bigfoot yeah. in the next one, especially. He's got some great gags. We'll <laughs> He's got about. some moves. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but but yeah, this this ends up the the big kind of like finale of this is that he 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 eventually gives up this investigation with Joanna, with everyone, because he's just like, this is stupid. I'm going to go back to my parapsychology uh, conference and do my whole presentation which is where uh, he's actually going to put this apparent devil worshiping farmer Hobart in, in into a trance. There's a whole sequence earlier too, where he goes to his family and you know, they kind of have a whole like creepy, almost like folk horror atmosphere where they're like, you know, yeah. he's been chosen, you know? And, and um, there's uh, th- this whole presentation sequence is where you do feel like you can't ignore it anymore. Like it's been staged literally in front of everyone. And there's uh, again, Turner's got some great, um, composition choices. I love that wide frame of the stretcher just off stage that makes it look like a corpse is about to be kind of like wheeled in. Oh, yeah. And then when the when the body is brought in to sort of hypnotize him, the spotlight hits the patient and it's just like the you know all these shadows in the audience as they're watching, you know, them try to basically like stimulate this guy and he starts ranting all about his his time allowed and his runic parchment and how, you know, in our, they kind of reveal it to be almost like a like a, you know, a curse horror film or like a precursor to the logistics of like an internet curse horror film or whatever, where it's like, (laughs) you know, you need to take that parchment. You need to give it back to the guy who gave it to you so that the demon will take him and not take you. Yeah. It it kind of has that same exact uh, mindset about it. Yeah. And, 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 but what's so funny is that he still is like, yeah, look at this fucking idiot. Look at this freak. And it's literally not until the guy is so filled with conviction of his own fear that he throws himself out of like a fifth story window and drops to his death. This incredible image of his body, like lying yeah. on the ground, everyone going yeah. and grabbing him. And that's when he goes, huh, like I had to really believe that this piece <laughs> of parchment was going to kill him. So maybe I should, you know, just for shits and giggles, I should maybe try and give the piece of parchment back to Mr. Carswell. And like, it's so funny that that's the, triggers the finale is this whole thing of being like what a display of fear (laughs) that this guy was (laughs) yeah yeah and i do like that there's um that like again i don't think besides the orb uh uh holden actually ever sees the demon be fully fleshed out is am i wrong on that is it only carswell at the the very end yeah, Cause I get her. Cause it, I, th- oh, yeah, I thought wait, it was something know. like because it because the ending um, dialogue hints that they don't really want to necessarily find out the entire truth because they're like we can go look at the body but why 
It, it, what's I'm trying to think of the line. I have it deep in my notes just because it's one of the last ones. Oh, it's maybe, maybe it's, it's better, better not, to, not know. to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I do find it interesting though that I think that fear is still very much there because he's convinced enough to just be at least with Carswell and be like, if the demon's coming for me, then it's coming for you. So we're just going to sit here and nothing's going to happen or the demon's going to come and that is a great pieces, moment. Yeah. That's know? such an asshole. Mo- like that's such a funny, like, yeah. like a way for us, like to be, to use his stubborn assholeness like, yeah. as, 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 a, as a skill point. <laughs> yeah. Like in, in, and it, you know, cause this big train finale where, you know, he is being like, well, I, I sort of believe that guy. So I guess I'll try to give this piece of parchment back to him. And, you know, Joanna is in the cart, like in a trance. And, you know, Holden is basically just being like, I'm going to call your your bluff about this whole situation by locking all of us in this train compartment together. Mm-hmm. And when it hits 10 o'clock and this piece of parchment turns into a fucking hairy demon that's going to electrocute us or slash us or do whatever <laughs> the fuck it's going to do, it's going to destroy this entire room. Um, yeah. and so, and, and that freaks Carso Carswell out and that turns it into the whole altercation where he does end up, you know, the, the, the cops come in and he slips him the parchment into his thing and it blows out onto the, the train window and into the tracks. And you just get that great shot of Niall McGuinness just like chasing a piece of paper along the railway. Yeah. Um, as there's, you know, as trains and, are you know, speeding by back and forth. Yeah. The, the, the actual shooting of the finale, cause, cause Turner, I think says that he didn't do it. So I don't know if that's true or not, um, but oh, okay. like it's 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 a pretty cool little sequence. If, it looks if, cool. even if you didn't do it. Yeah. I love the way that they um, use the, the because again they like I said the way it evolves the demon itself it starts as like kind of like a little ball of light and then grows into the fireball or smoke and then turns into the demon and because it's on tracks it has that like a train approaching kind of feeling as it's going down the tracks and at a certain point you actually do see I think a, a train kind of. Um, behind it as it's coming towards uh, cars well and it's it's just a very cool effect as if it's the, yeah. the, it is the exact metaphor of the end where they think that the trains just hit him and he was dragged along um, it's, but in uh, fact, yeah, it's I a love the, the ending se- sequence with the demon also I mean when it like it's just, it is so crazy when he, he it picks him up and it like just is yes. clawing at him and then just kind of tosses his body down mm-hmm. and, and yeah. like it's I also, fucking Godzilla I just, movie shit that it I picks know, him up and literally starts like ripping him to shreds in front of the train and every it's and it's using so the train nuts. as like a cover, but the the composition is that we can see above the train. So we actually just see a full giant demon monster pick up like a, the dummy of a man and just start fucking ripping him to shreds right on camera. It's like it is a really it's, incredible then, yeah. moment. They yeah. have the, and then they have the police come up and they say they're like and it, and his body's off screen and they say something like oh my god look at him like well he must have been dragged along by a train right like yeah, it's just it's such a good <laughs> way to like yeah just instill the most disgusting grotesque image you could possibly have in your mind yeah exactly like, yeah, that, yeah. and I like the two moments um, in the first one when the demons revealed it ends with him clawing right at the camera like right at the audience and then in this one it has him swallow the camera and I just I just really enjoyed both of those effects. Because the demon yeah. uh, design is so cool. I do think also the demon being shown at the end really does. I mean, I think, yeah, you could make a case either way for the beginning. But at the end, it really does help because it, it really is so horrifying. I think that if you just mm-hmm. saw him kind of running and then you heard that dialogue about, oh, look at him. He must have been dragged along by a train. That wouldn't even me- like mean anything. You know, that you wouldn't feel anything from that at all. But just the fact that you see the monster like just, yeah, just fucking up that dummy and then tossing it. It really just makes it so horrific to hear them be like, oh, my God, he's like mangled. It really just is like it, yeah. make, it, it feels gross and evil. I like. Yeah, the, like uh, I, 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 I agree. I think I think it's actually really it would be really incredible if 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 the movie was as Turner wanted and it was entirely ambiguous and it was totally like, you know, you you know, who do you believe? Who do you identify with? Like, are you more of a skeptical skeptical person? Are you a more, you know, kind of um suspicious of you know sort of like the, these old stories or that kind of deal and then to just confirm it for you right at the end with like a huge shock like that that is overwhelming and mm-hmm. you don't and it's it is this great unknown that you can't kind of reckon with and so that having this character have to defeatedly sort of acknowledge 
that, yeah, maybe there is this kind of inexplicable great beyond, because even if he didn't see that demon, he goes, yeah, well, I handed him the parchment and then he died. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like you can't reason with that or that's not a scientific thing. Like you just went, wow, that's fucking crazy that that happened. And so that, that's why it is kind of cool that the character does have to confront that and goes, you know what? Maybe I would like to keep that in the darkness and, yeah. uh, it, you know, it, not, it not reckon with that. Blinders <laughs> again, go home. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if, uh, if the sequence where Holden is running away from Carswell's house through the woods and the big smoke ball appears and the like invisible footprints start to like, kind of, do you know what I'm talking about? The footprints, oh, yeah. yes. like the footprints come, is awesome. which is incredible effect. It's so cool. But I wonder if that was, if turn, if that was a, a Turner thing, if you wanted that in there or not, like, cause I feel like that's, also a thing where like uh, you know to some degree it's, it's if pretty you're, definitive yeah you're fighting with a cat with the lights off like okay we kind of saw it was a leopard but like i get it that's that's sure, could be yeah. a psychological thing but i feel like seeing those like you know jurassic park ass footprints showing up is kind <laughs> of I, like, I i have a yeah. feeling that he did say that he shot that sequence but he, but again i think he was happy leaving it as again just kind of like footprints and leaving it Maybe. as the fog and that kind yeah. of stuff he could have been thinking because you have that scene with um um, Kurzweil where he's like I do have powers and he starts the wind up that it might just start to imply still a mystery of like well maybe Kurzweil is just the world's best magician ever and he's somehow pulling off these kind of like uh, illusions and then it leads up to the monster um, but either way I th- yeah that foot that footprint sequence is awesome we didn't even we didn't even really mention that I also like um, the kind of hopeless feeling that you get, well, I guess that you don't necessarily get, but Kurzweil would definitely have, um, where he sees the parchment just start bursting into flames. And it really recontextualizes the other scene that you have with Holden when he uncaringly just lets it go. Yeah. And he almost lets it go into the fireplace. Yeah, and he's just yeah, like, yeah. okay, sure, I'll grab it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, totally. if that thing's burnt, that's it. This, this thin piece of paper is the one thing that's kind of uh, you know, fighting against the demon in some way, shape, or form. It's the only thing that you can use to control it. So, um, that I thought that I just liked him watching it burn and just being like, "That's yeah. it. I have nothing." That left. is a that is a, a great scene when uh when Holden is just kind of letting it blow because even on the level before, even if you're not thinking about like, oh, this parchment is like the only thing keeping him alive, mm-hmm. it is just so tense and just like, dude, that's like your that's your clue, that's your evidence. Yes. Like, what are you doing? Just like go get it. You're yeah, just the, sitting at the down, very man. Least, you're just that's watching a lead. it. Yeah, at the very least, man, that's the lead. Totally, totally. Yeah. It does give you some kind of a. Uh, it's suspenseful in a way just built on that but yeah great yeah, movie turner's turner's so good at that stuff he is yeah, yeah i, I love no, this, this was movie. a this was a this was a blast and uh yeah pivoting towards reductive rating round this was a very solid um four for me um mm-hmm. w- once again huge fan of um Jacques turner and and his his skill at this kind of you know sort of like unsettling and sort of like dreamy and shadowy sense of, of 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 atmosphere his use of architecture i think he was pretty well merged with this subject matter like you mm-hmm. can tell that yeah. charles bennett who was this you know who who had worked with hitchcock that he had he was a he had familiarized himself with a very different kind of thriller and you could tell that in this material he saw a chance to you know kind of go back and do something closer to like val luton was doing do a kind of more ghostly eerie I mean, it, it, it's almost like part of like half noir, ha- like detective mm. movie, but like half also like a cult, like folk horror almost, almost deal. Like it's a, it's a, it's a really cool mix of those two genres and a kind of an early mix of doing those two, two genres. Um, yeah. I do think that Dana Andrews uh, is great at being a kind of on screen slimy asshole which totally. makes him actually kind of good for a parapsychology <laughs> professor who who prides himself on you know reason and 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 science even though he is in like a weird fiction satanic monster cult episode of like the x file or something like it's such a great concept and he he is kind of well built for that um i think that fucking niall mcginnis who plays carswell and peggy cummins too i i, I think all the performances are are um quite good even if the dramatics of it are just a little wonky just because it's like (laughs) he's so obviously a devil (laughs) worshiper everyone else is so obviously correct that there's a real monster and this guy's really summer summoning demons and shit um that you you do kind of just you can't help but laugh a little bit um but but once again turner there was literally like a handful of people on earth who were probably as good at as him at 
just having people walk around in a lavish space and making that feel like just one of the most menacing, like metaphysical things in the world. Um, and there's so many incredible sequences where he does exactly that. And even the sequences that he claims to have not done and not liked the, 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 the creature, uh, this fucking hairy, smoky fucking rubber Kaiju who likes to claw people to bits. It's, it's oh, yeah. even if it's a forced inclusion, it's it's a still a pretty great shock and it leads to a very very great ending where the rational man is forced to deal with the fact that yeah maybe there is a great lovecraftian beyond out there that can't be reasoned with and we should maybe be comfortable with that and it you know it's a it's a it's a really great ending really great atmosphere good performances yeah i had a i had a really good time watching this for the first time so if any and if anyone is yeah. like is a fan of something like cat people like this doesn't seem quite as well known but you know maybe maybe it should be i'd, I'd easily put this in like a double feature with cat people yeah yeah i would say if you like cat people or like i walked with a zombie too has a lot of this um this this like shadowy atmosphere, this mysterious atmosphere that he builds it builds into this story too. Um, I think uh, yeah, Turner's great. This is I think my fourth film that I've watched from him, so um, I'm a little more well versed in in his stuff than some of these guys from from this era. So, I, but I gotta say I'm a huge fan. I've got to check out uh, Nightfall. Even the Leopard Man that looks interesting. Another <laughs> another animal one that's <laughs> awesome. But uh, but yeah, he's just got such a good control of of atmosphere. Again, that like hallway uh, shot with all of the the open doors and his kind of paranoia building is fantastic. The uh, the monster design is awesome. Even if that maybe wasn't uh, Turner, I think it's it's great, and I love it. You know, attacking the camera. Um, I do agree that I think I think either one works. Whether you uh, present the monster right away or uh, kind of leave it a little bit more mysterious until the end. I would love to see a cut just with, you know, a, a more ambiguous intro into that. But I think, again, I think either uh, works. And I do, even though, you know, we were shitting on, not shitting on, but like kind of, you know, it's very, uh, he's an unlikable character, the guy that the, that Dana Andrews plays. But it, it, Andrews himself is fantastic at it. I, like it, it is very entertaining to watch. Um, it does get a little bit funny in its, uh, it, 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 just given how much you already know is true about the demon and the supernatural, it can be a little bit frustrating to watch him just completely put the blinders on. But eventually that also becomes kind of the point in a way. Um, it does maybe go a little too far, but it, it's still fantastic. And I do really like uh, Peggy Cummins. Um, she's very sharp in the film, and I like that the entire time they have her character basically not take any of Holden's shit. Uh, and and I found that very entertaining too. Like every advance he makes, she denies. Um, she's just constantly passionate about finding out the truth, and he just seems so passive about everything. Um, I really did like their dynamics. So um, yeah, this is great. Yeah, we'll Four we'll talk five. about her again at some point because she's great in uh, Joseph H. Lewis's uh, Gun Crazy. Oh, we'll awesome! Have to, she's awesome. the she's the lead in that, and she's um very very good. But for you, Cam. Yeah, I mean, I would I would also I think give this a four, probably probably a a pretty high four. I definitely mm -hmm. this is a movie that I will probably watch a million more times in my life. I love this movie. I think it's got it all. Yeah, the atmosphere is insane. It's so it's great for what look watching in the background, just because anytime you look up, there's something incredible looking on the screen. But it's also you know so engrossing. I love the the monster scenes so much. I'm so glad that they added them. I think there is some contention on like whether Turner actually didn't want it or if he was said it after the fact, like I know that some, like, I don't, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, but. there is, there is, there, there is, I, I think I read that there was like, there were early drafts of even in the pre-production notes that he was involved in that did have a monster in them. So some yeah. people wonder if he just maybe regretted doing it because mm. he didn't usually go that far and maybe he didn't think it turned out how he wanted or not. But yeah, there is some contention there for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think mm. this is one of my favorite monster reveals in a movie of all time, even if it does happen five Five minutes into the movie it is such a cool <laughs> reveal i mean yeah. just yeah the way that the just filling the entire screen with the demon and having it reach what did you think out. of the monster sound did any of you either of you have it was like a squeaky sound. sound i thought it was really yeah, i weird. was gonna i was gonna say our, our <laughs> friend of the pod meg shields had a review of it where she said that it's incredible that the monster just sounds like a squeaky wheel like yeah. You, just, yeah you need to you need to it sounds like they're the, just they're literally the wheeling the, on the big yeah. rubber <laughs> rig yeah. up to the camera <laughs> um but i i mean i just think that that's a way of, of showing a monster that you just never see of just having it literally done 
there is it's you might it might as well just be an insert shot you know what i mean like it is just Mm -hmm. dominating the screen there's nothing but a demon on screen and it's reaching straight for the camera i can imagine that being like horrifying if i was watching that in a theater and i was like well yeah yeah, and what and what a shock ending too to think that you're like watching like a like a screwball like noir like the 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 two characters have a dynamic oh who believes what and who's the who's the mystery killer and then just out of nowhere fucking godzilla just rips a guy in half on (laughs) screen like you have to imagine in 1957 people were like jesus christ totally (laughs) yeah Yeah. i also love the um that that they do like a superimposed giant beast foot uh, when he, when the initial, mm-hmm. I can't remember the the initial character that gets killed's name, but he's just looking up at it, and they superimpose this giant beast foot onto it, yeah. just to show the scale of the thing, which they it's don't do a lot. It's King Kong it, Godzilla shit. It's, yes, it's, it's awesome. massive. It's really yeah. massive. So that was cool too. I think also another thing that we didn't really talk about uh, that I really like about this is just the like um, Holden is 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 an is American, and I, he's like you know just mm. kind of headed over to 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 england and and all these he's kind of it's it's yeah it is very much the kind of folk horror vibe that i feel like was not yet in vogue uh that this kind of proceeds a little bit um that's really fun to see yeah just kind of it, it adds another dimension to like this is the 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 cynical uh new world american guy who's being confronted with you know the ancient horrors of the old world and traditions that he can't understand European and he, history he baby at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> absolutely but he's act he's he's in a, a strange the american land. detective going to the wicker man island and being exactly. like what the yes. fuck is this shit yeah, you know yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's that's such a fun element for like what kind of unfolds as yeah just a, a folk horror noir basically um i just i love that about this too i mean i yeah i just i really really like this movie this might be my favorite uh, Turner, I, I've, I haven't seen all that many, but I, I really do love this movie a lot. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Well, we, we also know my, my very last note. We also know who else loved this movie because I had no idea that this reference was from this movie. Uh, fucking Kate Bush. I, I, I didn't know that. The Hounds of Love, the track Hounds of Love opens with the, the li- dialogue from this movie. Oh, oh my yeah. God. I no idea. The uh, it's in the trees. It's coming. Oh, cool. Um, which which I had never I had never known that, and then I, I heard it in this movie, and I was like, "What do I know that from?" And then yeah, I, I eventually that. I eventually looked it up and saw other people talking about it. So I was like, "Okay, there you go, that's what it's from." Oh, so that's awesome. Martin that's Scorsese cool. and Kate Bush uh, also agree. Great horror film, one of the Approved. great horror films, nineteen fifties monster movies. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. Um, but uh, that is going to wrap it up for Night of the Demon nineteen fifty seven. We're going to be right back, and we're going to be talking about Night of the Demon. 1980. Bit of a different vibe, but you want to stick around for that for sure. Let's find the Sasquatch. Not far from here, a motorcyclist was found. There was no trace of the thing that killed him. Our Bigfoot's not playing games anymore. Maybe next time he won't be happy just to scare us. All right, we are back and we are talking Night of the Demon, the 1980 American, I think technically direct to video supernatural oh. creature horror and uh, video nasty film uh, directed by uh, one James C. Wasson, written and produced by one Jim L. Ball, as well as Mike William, and starring Michael Cutt, Paul Kelleher, and Melanie Graham. I'm saying all these names as if they are names that you know. <laughs> they are most certainly not names that anyone knows because they didn't make anything other than this movie. So unless you are a super fan of Night of the Demon, uh, you are the the guy, or, or uh, are a big fan of, I guess, maybe... James C. Wasson's like pornos, uh, which apparently are out there. <laughs> or uh, I do see that one of the the actresses, Joy Allen, was in Archie Bunker's place for a couple episodes. Oh. So if any big fans, maybe okay, maybe we yeah, got some big the, Joy well, Allen well, fans. Well, in the Michael house. Cut, the uh, Burt Reynolds lookalike, also apparently something he he plays someone in Volcano. Okay, the uh, Tommy Lee Jones Mick Jackson uh, movie. Hell yeah! So I. I actually watched that not that long ago and I do not remember him being in that movie. So I'll have to go back and try and find that now. Um, I was yeah, just this now looking, is... looking at the, the cast of this and the, the main character 
Michael Cutt as Professor Bill Nugent. But then I noticed further down the cast list, we have William F. Nugent as Lou Carlson. So I think the main character was named <laughs> after a different actor from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's just oh, creativity that's at its awesome. finest. That's on the fly thinking. You yeah. know, that's what that is. That is just sp- spontaneous filmmaking, people on the go. And yeah, this is a fucking strange one. This is like, this is a weird there is, one. There's so little information available online that I could find out about this one. I regretfully <laughs> did not have the Severin Blu ray to do the proper investigating. Apparently, there actually is quite a bit of special features for anyone oh. who does have that. And maybe there actually is some interviews with some people who made it. And I'd, I would like to hear more about that at um, some point. Because uh, from what I could find, by all accounts, this is essentially a $70,000 um VHS horror movie that didn't get released until 1983 um, for for home release. Um, it had a really difficult time getting released anywhere else because it was part of the sort of video nasty craze in in the UK, um, where the the Brits were actually trying to fucking like throw people in jail for making really vulgar movies. Um, so this found itself on the list of banned movies, uh, many of which we've talked about on the show, stuff like Driller Killer around that area as as well. Mm-hmm. And from from what I could glean, this guy was a gay porn director um, and his producer was a gay porn producer. And it looks like they got together with a bunch of friends in Northern California and uh, they just decided to make a Bigfoot scary movie and then the producer was like, well, also the slasher movies are kind of becoming a big hit. So what if we did a bunch of reshoots and retrofitted it into being uh, a really, really unpleasant slasher at the same time? <laughs> uh, and the whole structure and- is basically built like that, where you you just keep getting almost like campfire stories about the times that the Bigfoot did something <laughs> absolutely bizarre to a human being. Um, and it, and, and the whole film is kind of built in within a flashback already. So it does the flashback yeah. within flashback within flashback. And all I, that. I, there, I have to say another, e- that's another e- connection between the double feature They're both, they both had, uh, producer producers adding more monster scenes. Absolutely. True. Yes. True. <laughs> Didn't even think about and that. This so one has more gorilla filmmaking at the six, Fla- six flags, magic mountain <laughs> than, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> Turner, Turner had, um, <laughs> But Great there is definitely a little bit of a connection uh, right there. And I will say that like immediately throwing this on after having just watched the incredibly <laughs> just the, the elegance and the yeah. grace of Turner in just those incredibly moody and economical sequences, you know, the like consistent even that control of sequence, the atmosphere, you know. Yeah, where it sets up the mystery and the and 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 the mood and the visual sequencing, and there's very little exposition to it. Like, and in just pure a pure whiplash experience was being dropped into this, which was just so the opening so incredibly amateurish, <laughs> and you know, which this does get better than I will say. Yeah, but totally. it's just such a funny screenwriting way to open of like. Hey, professor, why are you all mutilated and in the hospital? (laughs) Well, you see, sir, have you ever heard of monsters in the forest? Well, they are real. And he's like, well, why don't you start from the beginning? And it's it's borderline (laughs) like uh, you might be wondering how I got here of like a professor just having, you know, bandages all over his face and coming up with an excuse to wrap around a story to that, which is that he's an anthropology professor uh, named Bill Nugent, played by Michael Cutt. Kind of another um, connection in the sense that it's like a, you know, well-educated man doing the the work instead of a detective. Yeah, and and and, and the whole thing is just structured around like a, a sort of, you know, him embarking on an expedition with his students to prove the existence of Bigfoot in, you know, sort of a rural region of 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 California only to eventually uh as they find out, classic slasher movie style get, you know, stalked and uh, as killed ta- as one the, by one. As the log line says here, systematically slaughtered <laughs> by yeah. the uh grisly sasquatch like creature that is uh prowling in the in the backwoods and and as a and classic really like 70s tools. holdover dude there's so much like like a tacky 70s flute like score yes. going on there's like there's it has so much like 
leftover from just like the rough 70s grindhouse era including being honestly pretty skeevy and pretty <laughs> like just like oh yeah, yeah. you know n- n- nasty and a little bit misogynistic and a little bit just like it has a, like a, every little bit of quality of that it's it's such like a post halloween post texas chainsaw like knockoff and and i have to wonder when the slasher stuff was put in because supposedly this is pre-friday the 13th but the VHS didn't come out till 1983. So I'm like, yeah. did they film more stuff and in, in time for the VHS release? Because it is so close to being like a regional backwoods, like Bigfoot Friday the 13th, essentially, yeah. like through and through. It is. Even the red iris, like POV Bigfoot, like vision stalker shots, the series of like gory deaths, the hilariously cheap, the, like fur suit that you can sometimes just like see the dude and, and the his cre- bare chest, like painted brown in it. <laughs> and it's the creativity of every kill. Like, it's not like it's the Sasquatch, you know, using rocks or, or something like that every single time. Like the guy uses the the tools that the people bring in and, and, and he does things that like a human serial killer would do. Um, and so it gives you this, it's weird to have that kind of what feels like anyway, a little bit of irony in some of the Sasquatch kills that they should be funny. And that's something that you see mostly in the serial killer movies of the, of the eighties when they get like super campy and stuff like that. But then the rest mm-hmm. of the movie is very serious. And honestly, like you said, pretty disgusting in, 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 in some parts. And they take those scenes very seriously. Um, but then you have things like the the Sasquatch ripping off a man's penis or throwing a guy in a sleeping bag just around like a whirlwind before he throws him into a tree. It's it's like you just you can't really get a grasp on the the tone that they're going for. It's just like yeah. there's so much happening. Me and my brothers were just laughing our asses off. This it, is it, oh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's it's a great put it on with some some friends who are prepared to see the levels of nastiness included in this movie and, and, and have a, yeah. have a, have, a, have a good time with it. You know for sure. Yeah. Definitely. This is like just totally like real scuzzball shit. Like it just is <laughs> yeah. so. So I, it really does feel a little like not not by very much, but it does feel a little bit ahead of its time. It feels to me a lot mm-hmm. like, you know, the types of of 80s and 90s movies you'll see where it's just literally like teens in their backyard and they saw Friday the 13th and they're trying to make <laughs> yeah. something really nasty. Just like the quality of the audio even is like yes. so it just feels like a, a fucking like shot on video 90s disgusting gore movie. But it, it, it also like, yeah, the gore in this is like, you know, pretty good for that mm-hmm. type of thing and it just it gives it it just feels like crazy the vibe is so bizarre and i have to say i i watched this double feature in the other order like i watched uh the I 1980 <laughs> night of the demon first and then i watched <laughs> and i rewatched the jacques turner one after and i do think that the 1957 night of the demon just basically completely erased this one from my brain like i think <laughs> it just like blasted this one out of me like i oh, feel yeah. like i can remember like some of it but i and i watched it like this you know i watched it like less than 12 hours ago i feel like it's like i feel like i dreamed it <laughs> well yeah, it i mean like that's honestly the dream. vibe that it has like it has such a leisurely pace that almost reminded me of some of the like sort of like porno horrors we've talked about yeah, on this show and they, there's so many scenes like like interchangeable scenes of characters walking in a forest or sitting around a campfire and then it doesn't help that they've chosen a kind of complicated fragmented like a chronological sort of like editing approach that as Jamie was putting it's like flashbacks within flashbacks and there's a lot of and and as a result it's a lot of like stopping and starting versus like sustained suspense sequences like we saw so like what Turner was so good at and and for the most part this is very much a movie that just alternates between like okay, here's a crazy scene that's happening. Is it one of the amusingly like bizarre ones where a character is saying something doesn't make sense or like the plot is really strange or like we're about to see an insane kill or is it just like a very slow and kind of sleepy march that you're like, I kind of have some idea of where this movie is going. And, you know, I, I, I can, on some level, I guess, appreciate some of the, you know, the sort of cheaply made kind of grainy look of it there. It definitely does have a, an upsetting and kind of mutilating kind of mean streak to it that I I kind of appreciated. And, but it, but it is just like, ultimately this is, uh, if you think that nastiness can be humorous, this is a movie for you outside of that. Like if you just think that that you'll just find that unpleasant, (laughs) this is like, you know, designed to be, 
uh, you know, just kind of like it, it feels designed to, to be passively watched and to almost like fall asleep to <laughs> if yeah, you're but, a fucking psycho. Like yeah. that's that's the that's vibe the I got yeah, from it's, it. It's not even the type of nastiness <laughs> that you get with these types of movies where it's like in your face trying to be nasty and funny. Like it really does just feel like it. it I feel like it makes it so much grosser. Just that scenes like the motorcycle guy getting his dick ripped off because it's like, filmed it sincerely does, yeah <laughs> it's not funny. played for like whoa look yeah. at this like oh my god like somebody would do in this nor like you know then that that type of movie i'm talking yeah, it's, about it's, it's like, not like a peter jackson the, gore gag or something exactly right? Right. It's like, like, look at the pure like, fun oh, this, on display this is just, just what happened of, this is what happened <laughs> yeah. to the guy and it's yeah, really they're gross bring, they're trying to bring about like how powerful the sasquatch is but in order to do that they just come up with the most silly and insane uh kill uh, uh, sequences and so some of them are genuinely just gory and blunt and those kind of work with the Sasquatch but then there's others that we've already mentioned that are like what the what the hell is going on like is this Sasquatch having a good time while he's doing this like he's being creative about it it just feels uh, strange at certain moments but I do the uh, like there's the one thing that kind of has that porno vibe during dialogue sequences where it feels like a very most of the time anyway, like kind of a stationary camera and they don't do a lot of cutaways. Like there's not even a lot of shot reverse shot. It's just like place the camera in front of five people and they'll go through all the dialogue that we need to know about the story until we get to an inevitable flashback of some sort so that we can have our Sasquatch sequences. One of the like four or five flashbacks that take place throughout the film. And actually even the even technically the opening sequence, which is, you know, it, it starts as a, as a flashback of like the fisherman getting yeah. killed too, right? Which, which is the one where he has his arm torn off and you kind of get a little bit of like an impression of like, there's a Bigfoot, you know, hairy Bigfoot, you know, creature uh, out there. Yeah, you have the but red it is filter done in this, eyes POV thing and all that. Yeah, and, and you, you get the sort of like gushing blood from his arm mm-hmm. hole like onto the sheet that's being hung there. And you do get a, a pretty a, a cool shot that I actually like the title shot, which is yeah, the, the cool. blood like seeping into the uh, sort of like muddy Sasquatch like footprint. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. very cool. I also the, Dude, the this thing is what I'm the, talking about. I rem- I remember watching this and like seeing the the red like perspective shots with like the kind of red circle and being like, this is so crazy. This is so bizarre. What is going on? And like really noticing it every time and thinking about it a lot. And then I had completely forgotten about those <laughs> until you just said it right now. <laughs> I feel like it just like <laughs> escaped Dude, me completely. Well, the, another thing about like this the, 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 these little things that they throw in. Some of them are really effective. Like I really do like the the PO with the red filter and all of that and I again Josh I do like that that blood into the Bigfoot um, the the footstep it's really awesome but then some of the editing due to the flashback uh, idea that they use is very funny because they obviously filmed these kill scenes separate from the dialogue scenes so every once in a while you'll get something that like completely um, is a juxtaposition of vibe from what you just saw to where the flashback comes back, like where the where yes. it comes back to the present. So there's one where the guy gets his dick ripped off, and yeah, like the, the, the great the way, sequence of the leather clad motorcyclist who like steps on the side of a mountain path to smoke a joint and take a piss, full <laughs> hog out, full shot, full. You dick. Just see it; you it's, see it's, a, it's, it's out there. Bigfoot doesn't like that. He doesn't like getting peed on. Uh, <laughs> that's one rule I learned about. Well, watching Bigfoot movies is the, you know, this oh, is lore. Does not um, appreciate and, it. And, and, and not only does he tear his dick off, he actually lifts him up off his feet <laughs> by yeah. the dick, and which, which, which pulls it off. <laughs> and he leaks blood all over the road and on his bike. My favorite detail of which is his, Oh no. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Just, no. My, just, my dick is gone. <laughs> just some genuinely great moments of screams, which I will, I, uh, there's another one with I, the girl. We'll, we'll come back to and, that too. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the girl we'll one from the, yeah. But um, unreal. <laughs> what's so funny about this is it's very long too. Like this, this whole shot is him. You see him ride up on the motorcycle, park, take the joint out, take the piss, get his dick ripped off. He even walks towards the camera with his like dangling half penis, b- b- bloody, just going down his jeans. And then yeah, it, it almost like, reminded me of the final shot of uh, pieces. If anyone else remembers the 1980s, <laughs> like sort of like you know bizarre slashers that almost feel like they're a parody of the slasher. Um, yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I, I and, just saw that recently in the theater again. And I was like, wow, that's another movie that ends on just like the reanimated corpse grabbing a dick and just fucking pulling. And it just like gore and ripping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so it was funny to see it again. It's so aggressive and it's just right in your face. He's screaming all of that. And then it cuts back to the guy who's been telling this story around the campfire, the professor. <laughs> and he doesn't acknowledge what he really just said because it's just them. The way they edit it is probably start a flashback. Okay, now we'll film you ending the flashback. And instead of acknowledging what he said, he just goes like, all right, gang, well, let's go to sleep. <laughs> it's the yep. funniest. I want to get a fresh I start in the morning. So <laughs> fucking hard just because I could tell they didn't really think that through. And it and, and all I could imagine is him like around the campfire going like, and then he just grabbed his dick, rips it right off. He's bleeding down his jeans. He's screaming for the love of God. Why is this happening to me? Anyway, let's Sweet go dreams. to sleep, guys. Yeah. Sweet dreams. <laughs> like that, that shit made me laugh so fucking hard. So yeah, that's that. Some of the editing, although very weird and jolted, somehow still works on an entertaining value, just because it's so messy. Yeah, the, the fact that this movie is framed as like a series of literal campfire story murder flashbacks <laughs> is is like while the professor and the students are doing this investigation into these disappearances, which is just triggered by like this like home super eight footage they they find of a mm-hmm. hairy it look what looks like a, just a hairy guy attacking. It does look girls. like okay. a hairy guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, well, guess, what better. is Bigfoot ultimately? You know, he's just a big hairy guy. Yeah, some um, of the shots but, are better with the Sasquatch makeup. It depends on like the angle, but that one where they reveal it in the super eight legitimately looks like just a very hairy man <laughs> and that's it yeah is well, and, and, and and it's funny that the the flashbacks are just like they feel like we just cut to them at random they're just put yeah. in where oh the, they're at a campfire again i kills. guess we're gonna tell another story and there's so the the big one is the dick getting torn off and we focused <laughs> on that because everyone focuses on that because it's a just an unbelievable and it's moment. so like well, again but, dick is but there's three other flashbacks right so there's the one which is the jazzy like soft core sequence in the van where <laughs> so where the man in weird. the fursuit just like yeah Yanks the naked man off nipple sucking duty and he causes him <laughs> to just like bleed all over and slide down the windshield. But it's done in like such a, so a slow, slow, elongated fashion that it doesn't really earn. It's so it's just like we, we like you. We were watching this initially. It's the sex scene. It's just softcore sex, basically, where it's two naked people making out on top of each other. And it goes on for way too long in the edit before it cuts away. And then they do it again with the the death and her strange screaming. And you, yeah, I'll let you say, you, Josh, you said the funniest thing in your review. The, just the it comparison. was literally the the opening scene of Blowout yeah. when <laughs> yeah. the girl is screaming and 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 they're like and she's like she won't stop screaming and they all just like their ears kind of pierce and they're all like oh just oh like it's what full, what is that it's full on <laughs> porno moaning it's so yeah. horrible. <laughs> I and and, 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 and you can see her TV looking at the camera started. confused. You can act, you can actually see her being like, you know, do I do I do another one? Do I keep yeah, screaming? Yeah. Is he like is, is he still sliding down? Am I still scared? Like you can actually like yeah. see her like go through that eye process. Man, I was oh watching I was God. watching this on my on my TV in my living room at like one PM and that scene started and I was like, oh, okay. All right, yeah, we're gonna turn this down just for this scene. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the funniest details is once he starts sliding down, you think he's already dead. Head, and she's doing this weird scream moan thing and then he starts to do it too so they just <laughs> mean, like it's like they're communicating in this weird scream moan language and it's oh my god dude it's the strangest and, and then you thing. think it freeze frames but it doesn't the camera just keeps moving in and it's very clearly she's just been asked to like be Stay sit there. there silently it's such a well what a, like a just a, a genuinely bizarre little little I, sequence and like and, and that's not even like the the least of them because i mean like the most like normal one is the woodsman one which is the guy just doing like he's just doing woodsman shit he's just chopping wood in a plaid shirt takes a moment to wipe his bandana glances away from his axe rookie mistake you know <laughs> yeah. bigfoot mischievously you know he pulls one of his pranks and he you know grabs the axe he just sinks it into his shoulder that's like very common one you know not in in the grand scheme of things not one of the more memorable ones one of the more memorable ones the fucking girl scouts oh yeah dude the the, the story Weird. they get is that is that they're just forging a new path for the group <laughs> and so they're like I, we're just gonna wander to a path no one's ever taken before and then it, it, and so they they say that in the beginning of the flashback then they go into the flashback it's the two girls being like well 
we found a new path. Should we go back to the main trail? And they have like the giant like Girl Scout sweaters on. Like this is borderline like parody shit. Yeah. And it looks like a, they, a porno's about to happen. They also look like they're like way older than they should be for like 12 year old Girl Scouts or stuff. It's very strange. It's just a whole weird scene. And then for some reason, they pull out knives and start running around with knives when they get scared that someone is like stalking them. And they end up running into Bigfoot, who uh, the physicality of this, I could only describe as Bigfoot grabs two Girl Scouts and he just starts like ramming them together like dolls. (laughs) Yeah, he's holding like dolls or, or like symbols, you know, like crashing them. And he just starts beating them together. Until they <laughs> stab each other to death. Yes. Which is just a, which is a, just an awkward bit of staging that you're like, do you guys, you, you couldn't come up with anything else. It's you know, so like that was strange. That, that, that was the mode. Okay. And what's weird too <laughs> is, and this is kind of consistent throughout the whole film, is um the, the very, <clears throat> like it becomes abstract almost, the sound design in this, where yeah. so much of it is cut out and it's very bare and you really only get like, the scratches, like, like one that's that really uh, 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 comes out to me is the um, the one where it's another sex scene, but it's not the one in the van. It's the one where they're just there again. It's a guy on top. Is it, is, is it the one where Bigfoot and, gets jealous and claws yeah, the guy's and back? He, right, he claws the guy's back. He's like, and, hey. I want to get like <laughs> yeah, and you'd think the scratching would be like just just for the sense of the film and kind of the ex, the excitement or tension of it would be a little bit more like dominating in its in its scratch design and it no, it's really actually kind of a light. gentle scratch. And then it he was does, kind of he was he was like, do you do you guys are you open to a third? Yeah, like his, yeah, yeah, you know, it Bigfoot's is. Idea, it might it might know? have been <laughs> his idea of what, what like sensuality is. Yeah, he's just like he's yeah. trying to massage, but he went a little too hard. He didn't realize. Yeah. Um. And then after they do this cut to the guy reacting to that scratch, and everything is completely bare again, except for him going like ah, and um, <laughs> and and the cutting again is is too long. It so everything feels very just kind of. Awkward, um, but because of the bare sound design, it also has this strange. I don't know. I don't know if it's intriguing. It just feels um, like you're watching a strange nightmare. Like it doesn't make any sense, really. Um, and it just and there feels- is too much quilt and sleeping bag uh, sex happening in a movie <laughs> where they are all hunting Bigfoot in a forest who's murdering people. Like it's just rookie mistake yeah. stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, we Come we on. saw Bigfoot pick a dude up in his sleeping bag, twirl him around above his head a, a dozen lot. times, and then <laughs> hurl him like a sack of potatoes and like gruesomely impale him on a tree branch. And this is before Jason did this. Yes. Do, 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 Jamie, do you remember which one Jason does this in? He does this in one of his movies. I think it's Seven. in the seventh one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's in yeah. New so blood. big, big, bigfoot, bigfoot has him beat. Yeah, that's you know? crazy because so. I think that's in the later '80s when he does that one, number seven. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah he yeah, beat so. him by almost ten years. Pretty impressive, bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Not bad. There, yeah, and there's and there's a big difference between their characters too, which I'll bring up later. Which is that, uh, as Jamie has brought up before, uh, J- even Jason knows rape is bad. Oh yeah, um, Bigfoot does you know? is not aware apparently. Yeah, <laughs> which uh, t- Jason takes Manhattan, you know, classic Jason movie. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he does. You know, he but, does end up killing that girl, but he does save her from <laughs> sexual assault. So <laughs> still kind of a good guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but no, the, the the thing that makes this movie, I think. Because we've been really focusing on the fact that this is, you know, kind of just a very uneven, amateurly made kind of like slasher. And so much of the movie operates in that way. So so much of it has that like strange, you know, it's kind of an excuse to call it dream logic because it really just. Right. It's just kind of bad. Really just in a way. Yeah. But (laughs) but like but but functionally, too, there is like enough low budget grindhouse style to it that i do kind of go yeah i I could see it i could see if someone wants to make the pretentious review about how this is like watching it's like a it's like a it's like how will sloan calls ed wood movies a dream you know so it's like you know i if someone wants to say that from night of the demon go 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 ahead Uh, but the thing that really separates this is the um 
the actual eventual procedural aspect, which is, you know, in lots of 70s mustaches and rack <laughs> zooms and, you know, taking a riverboat in, into the forest and kind of doing all this stuff. And of course, there's like a grumpy, evasive old man who knows more than he's willing to talk about and, <laughs> and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, you know, and, and actually everyone is kind of like the one thing I do know is there isn't any Bigfoot in these woods here or anywhere else. It's, you know, just a it's like kind of like a Loch Ness monster just doesn't exist but this is all a cover for the fact that sort of similar to the previous night of the demon this is also quasi a kind of folk horror cult film a little bit because yeah. they bribe yeah. the one guy's yokel ass with a bottle of whiskey and the, and he starts telling them stories about the crazy old lady wanda who had an illegitimate monstrous baby that died and she was the daughter of a psycho preacher we thought he saw the devil and he self-immolated or something and maybe there's like a connection to like an inbred like hillbilly cannibal hills have eyes cult or something like that you know a little bit <laughs> of like yeah. a demon antichrist or a wicker man sex ritual all this kind of stuff which they eventually do walk on when they're like let your let the seeds of hell grow deep within her as they're having like this little naked man come and like mount a woman in the middle of the forest and you just have the student characters just looking on being like i can't believe i'm seeing this (laughs) yeah (laughs) I really wow. did not expect the movie to take that turn at all. It really <laughs> me caught me neither. so off guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the, the thing is, that, like that uh, was when I went. I'm fucking dreaming. What the fuck yeah, is happening? <laughs> I mean, it's also yeah. You don't the thing. The funny part about it is like you fully don't. You don't need that. Like this would be such a <laughs> this would be such a complete picture if they literally the entire movie was them wandering through the woods and just having flashbacks about Bigfoot and then they have the big <laughs> Bigfoot coming into the house at the end. I would be like, oh yeah, of course. Makes sense. That's the movie. But there's also <laughs> just the most insane like it just takes the craziest turn. I don't yeah. know who thought of it or why they thought that a Bigfoot movie needed any of it. Yeah, the last <laughs> like 20 minutes when they start to reveal like Emmett um, what what he did with the the daughter Wanda, who we just dis- I think discover from the guy that you were just talking about, Josh, when he gives him the whiskey, they're like, "There's this woman named Wanda deep in the woods, and she's you know had a experience with the Sasquatch that you need to find out, and and all of that." So they 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 go to her to try to figure it out, but she's very traumatized and won't talk to anybody. So then they try to hypnotize her, <laughs> and they were like, "Is this connected to the giant like straw and wood like effigy of Bigfoot that the whole <laughs> yeah. community?" is like worshiping or like protecting <laughs> as some sort of deity Could or something like I wonder if there's like something going on here you know <laughs> yeah I do another connection is uh, they the one do, dude who also just pulls out his gun and just starts shooting in the air at one point too yeah. where you just oh, they're yeah. like hey stop stop the weird <laughs> sex <laughs> shit you can cut it out yeah that's enough yeah, <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> enough of this fucking shit um absolutely i also the other connection i guess from night of the demon 57 uh was um they have hypnotizing again to get information which i find yeah. oh yeah that's true yeah so they're, did, they're, that's a, it's that's almost a like they're based off of that. each other it's almost like it was on a purpose <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh my god! But yeah, this. The, the but, but 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 no, that like this stuff does feel just, in my opinion, just weirdly disconnected from like sure. the s- low budget slasher film because you'll have a scene that's like kind of silly, but kind of just has a, a a little bit of blunt effectiveness to it, which is like that guy who just like Bigfoot just like pushes him into a tree, so he shoots himself in the head. You <laughs> know, and you're just so like, oh, awesome. you know, like that's something that's something I'd see in like a fucking knockoff of a Friday the Thirteenth movie or something. Oh, yeah, you know, totally. And then, and then it just gets so much darker and brutally sad when it yes. introduces Wanda and the whole backstory. And they, you know, they, the, these kids, honestly, they basically just re-traumatize her by giving her candy and hypnotize her. And they, That's you true. know, end up the whole point is to bringing unlock back that bad memory. <laughs> yeah, and and they just unlock this. You know, again, this is. <laughs> We've heard, there's so many flashbacks within flashbacks in this, oh, and yeah. the key to the movie is unlocking an extended flashback <laughs> inside the mind of this traumatized little girl at the beginning, which is played by the same like middle aged actress. Yeah. She just like <laughs> she yeah, says right. she's 15 years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just put her in a dress, and they're like, "You're 15 now." <laughs> it's, oh my god. 
it's um, and and it's an insane it's so sequence of like detailing her entire repressed abusive like christian Re- upbringing yeah. her father like screaming about her being defiled because she like liked a teenage boy and then there's this entire extended like legitimate like full-on rape sequence where bigfoot in the middle of a thunderstorm is just like on top of her and you know which her 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 father like thought was a satanic satanic demon and she's just screaming like you did this papa which is like sort of true even if it's kind of hilariously delivered but there, there is i guess an idea that his like imagined sexual violation or corruption of her comes true in the force of big in the in in the form of bigfoot but the the, the <laughs> way that they do it where it's like a shot where you can see bigfoot's like face as he's fucking you see and him just you like, see bigfoot's O face, dude. You do. Uh, it's wild. It, like I, I was it, like shocked that they even bothered including. Here's the thing: it, the, the implications honestly, of all that's this. In so this bad. Kind of it, oh, that's it's bad. so the, like the thing about this movie is like it. All of these things I think could be implied in this kind of a disgusting film. And so this th- this sequence, I don't necessarily have. Um, a problem with in, in its ideas just because we've seen things that are this kind of bizarre and disgusting, but I think it's the way that they just go about to shoot it. Like Again, a soft shoot, core yes, sequence is just so strange. Like, you yeah. shouldn't shoot it the same way that we've shot the other two soft core porn people uh, do their scenes before they die. It should be very different. It should be more applied there. You know, you could maybe have one shot that kind of it's, once or two seconds and it cuts away and kind of like lingers in your head or something, but they just focus on it. It's a, it's just way too much. I will say that especially sequence, too, because she um, ends up like, you know, she ends up getting pregnant and she ends sure. up like having a relationship Although, to Bigfoot because she well, cares yeah, that, about the father of her child and all of this. And I'm like, why is this? In here? It's, it's so, so crazy. Crazy. I, just, I, I can't, it's I can't understand <laughs> why these people made this movie because yeah, you don't, <laughs> It's you not. Don't know I, the point I, of I it, feel really, like yeah. no, these the the makers of this movie so clearly do not. They don't care about Bigfoot. They did not set out to be like, let's make a movie about Bigfoot because this is like yeah. uh, honestly barely a movie about. There's Bigfoot. none of the <laughs> like, like like. There's I, I've I've seen a a couple little clips because my my brother will watch documentaries sometimes and and I was thinking that maybe they would throw in some of the you know the lore or something like that yeah, and no, they really nothing. don't they it's, really it's, don't it's they're not, just like he's has, a bloodthirsty has, rape machine it's really yeah, awful it's completely I think it's it feels like a, a cash in movie like it feels like a cynical cash in movie like where they're like, okay, Bigfoot's popular. Let's make a Bigfoot movie, but oh, maybe Bigfoot's not that popular. So let's not put him on the poster and let's call the movie Night of the Demon instead yeah. of having anything to do with anything really. And yeah, then, yeah, but like, it, the, but that's how? Not yeah, like which Night I although tricking something. that audience into watching something this unpleasant might be something that they're going for. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Like, I, yeah, I don't know. You really, it's it's impossible to me to figure out. Like, yeah, you can't expect that this movie is going to do well in any way. I mean, they try to do just, what they do do is they try to. The professor says it after where he says he's trying because he's the last of his kind. He's trying to continue the the genes. That's that's his motivation for the Bigfoot. So like the bare minimum you could say is that it's. It's just like you know, this is the this is the the, the gross part of nature here. If, if yeah, totally. you know, like, it, but th- there's nothing really that really dives no, into I that. Mean, it's yeah, all you just, just have you just you see a movie shit. like this, and you just have to imagine that these people are just in it for the pure love of the game. Like this yeah, is just yeah, the shit that just, they want to be doing, and wanna, they just they will t- any take ev- any avenue to get to this final product, and you know whatever they can. However, you can secure seventy thousand dollars to make your <laughs> yeah. disgusting, I will, uh, disgusting finale. I yeah, will say like, um, the dude, one the finale thing is about so this, nuts. Yeah, the one thing about all this sequence with the flashback and everything is that I do like that he the the director seemed to want to because I think he realized how fucking insane and bizarre it is. He does start to use a little bit more of like actual strange uh, uh framing like when the the dad is being pretty abusive it's very these unkiltered close-up shots of him while he's doing it there's this one shot that yeah, I actually he, did he, really he throws like. in the wide angle lensing and stuff too yeah, right and like shooting yeah. stuff the, from stranger angles and stuff yeah. yeah like one shot that does kind of i think really works and it is horrific um but i th- i think again it's something that that 
is decent directing is when he puts the wide angle lens on the ceiling after the the Sasquatch baby has been birthed. The mutant and, and, demon and he, baby, like, the he, damnable he, offspring inside my unholy yes. daughter. And you the know? father like lifts it with one hand towards the camera and because of the wide and, angle, and it just starts screaming and shit. Yeah, and it gives like a, a Sasquatch cry scream or something like that. It's it's that was like so fucking just yeah, that's gross a good shot. And bizarre and yeah. cool with the shot that I was like, this is more what I'm looking for. I don't need the flat softcore porn sexual assault scene with with Bigfoot you know if that's gonna be yeah in the, there, the, the, just, the whole like weird domestic angle where she where it becomes claustrophobic and she's he's trying to like get her to abort the demon baby with like poison and shit yeah. like that and you know it's and uh crazy. The, the the scene too where the you know the kids after functionally like re-traumatizing her and just you know so many scenes of her like screaming around her house while they're just like investigating it like Scooby Doo characters and shit yeah. they are not taking any of this as like intensely as she is no but it was it results in that um that uh sequence where they the, the they dig up the skeletal remains of like the baby Bigfoot and they you know they they, they anger it who I guess feels some sort of connection to the dead baby and and its mother and all this kind of again it's so strange that we're saying these words <laughs> um but uh it, the, the one thing I like about this is that it is uh revealed uh that she quote unquote saved its father by burning her dad alive and that sh- other great shot of like his melted hand reaching through like oh, the fiery yeah. cabin that she's locked him in really like, good. that's a fucking nasty shot and mm-hmm. again yeah it, it, it feels like you're just all of a sudden watching like like an x-rated melodrama about this fucking like bigfoot and his rape victim and her abusive father and this like poor woman who's just stuck but you've just been have having so much abuse done to her yeah it is such a different vibe and such a different movie that then they just go well what if we just finished on a you know on a <laughs> on, on a, a fucking set piece that's sort of like i tried to kind of compare it to it feels like a no budget like lucio fulci version of like the night of the living dead totally. like barricade siege sequence I when it's just like you night have of the living dead yeah. yeah yeah you have them like barricading the windows and bigfoot trying to break his 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 way in and uh, you know and it's it, it really just is like a 10 minute sequence with an extremely high body count set piece which oh, yeah. i which i realized was because like most slashers kill off their characters as they go. <laughs> but we've been, everyone's this who's one, been dying has been in flashbacks. The it, this has time. been, it's been all flashbacks. Like <laughs> nobody in the group has died except for the one guy who like shot himself. That's actually smart. You know, now we get a big it's economical a big scene at the end where we can kill everybody <laughs> yeah. that we've, you know, ostensibly maybe in a different move who we've grown to care about over, <laughs> over the course yeah. of the movie. No, but with, uh, with these characters, you're like, dude, they're just mistreating this woman who's like yeah. the most mistreated woman I've ever seen in a film. <laughs> it is funny yeah. how uncaring they are after they re-traumatize her and she comes back to the present, but she's just dealing with that now and they're just kind of like, all right, so we got the info. We're moving on <laughs> to yeah. the case here. <laughs> like it, it feels so passive. It's it, like, it is funny in a way, but it just yeah. mean because I, like, again, the director has some control sometimes, but very often it's, it, it's not very well controlled. So all of these things that might work in a different film, you know, tonally, it's still incredibly bizarre and messy. Yeah. I just, I was thoroughly entertained. I will say that. So I do, I do <laughs> love this ending set piece. I think this, mm-hmm. it kind of, it, I mean, not that I disliked the movie at all. It definitely, you know, no, I mean, yeah, no, I, I mean I, yeah but the ending really kind of ratcheted it, it up a notch for me. Just the slow motion part where Bigfoot is like oh, smashing yeah. the guy through the window. Like, I felt like like I, that kind of made my skin crawl a little bit. Like just the action of a of being smashed through a window, just slowing that down feels so. It just like I don't yes. know. It feels textural and gross. Totally, totally. And and the whole I forgot about that until you said it. But really, the whole sequence once he gets into the house, it's so is completely slow. slow motion. And yeah, I think it's, it's the way so they horrible. Did it. Is because I think that why they did it is because one, I, you, they're stretching out the gore, like you said. And then the other thing I think is if they did it in normal, um, just in, in a normal pace, 
I think the the suit itself wouldn't come off as powerful as it does mm-hmm. in slow motion. There is something about watching them just get grabbed in slow motion and then like thrown into a window that makes it feel like he has more strength than maybe it would look like if it was just going normally. So yeah. I think it yeah. works yeah, both it, ways in, in that sense. Yeah, it's a very cool mix of it being so slowed down and uncanny and then also throwing in that really creepy like vibrating hum kind of like, like score no to it a little bit to too. It. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Well, if a friend of the pod, Steve Carlson described it as it sounds like a guy trying to hump a theremin and that <laughs> I thought was spot on. That's Dude, exactly that's what it so is. Good. Yeah. yeah. I do feel like that's this is the on. one, the one part where it maybe graduates a little bit into you can, you can say it's a little bit like a nightmare or a dream as opposed to just like in an, Oh, for sure. Like, like the, this straight up, this is like really almost accidental together. art film, like yeah, totally. bath kind of a, I, of a, I, of a yeah. finale. I think just so much of this is like like the staging of it is not that unique but by slowing it down it really this is why I was kind of comparing it to Fulci it just does become like people dying gruesomely and horribly and for screaming a long time. and it's and it's it's just it's maximized for the most amount of like duration and yeah. slowness and yeah. that really accentuates what I like so much about Fulci stuff which is that the kind of like <laughs> how unbearable and inevitable this stuff feels yeah. like you've seen the set piece before you know where this is going it's like yeah that guy's neck is going to get slid across that broken piece of glass or that one guy yeah maybe he'll fall on that saw blade and he'll get disemboweled. I did not expect him to literally just start <laughs> pulling the guts out, out. Yeah. and start like fucking dancing and fucking attacking people with it and shit, whatever he's doing with it. But like, you know, that was the only detail where I didn't know where the rest of this was going. As soon as you see him grab a pitchfork, you're like, yeah. oh, here we go. Well, now I'm going to sit here for 20 seconds and wait for that pitchfork to brutally go through that woman. And, and, and again, there, there saying, is something I mean, to yeah. that quality that does, it, it does slow it down and make it feel kind of sad. Just, just literally yeah. like, like on a, on a functional level too, especially I think the, in the slow motion scene, the window smashing through the window was was the one that really got me more than anything else. I don't know why, but I, I think just, yeah, like on a functional physical level, like the way you, you were seeing violence on the screen and it's gory and you kind of wince and you want to look away from it and then you do and then you look back and it's still, still happening. it's the same it, shot. It's yeah, the exact same thing that's still happening. Like you just, yeah. it, 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 yeah. it literally just takes one exactly. bad feeling that, that, that and stretches is, it into that's five the philosophy. bad feelings. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That is the exact <laughs> philosophy of every time when you're watching a Fulci sequence and yeah. there's a uh, raw piece of like splintered wood sticking out <laughs> and like a zombie is uh, sh- slowly bringing an eyeball closer to it yeah. for yeah, like and- 60 seconds it's the same philosophy of just like oh my god and like ha- fucking just do it already it, I can't look at this anymore and it has that strange uh, quality to it too where you're watching something like with the zombies with Fulci you're like why are these zombies doing anything more than just trying to get the brains but they're like actively suspensefully bringing yeah, the they're fucking sadistic, eye towards yeah. the, the splintered <laughs> wood um, and it's the same thing with the Sasquatch where he's he's grabbing a pitchfork and using it just like a human serial killer would and it's it, it just adds to this bizarre quality of it that just doesn't make any fucking sense at all, but it is yeah. entertaining nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. And and shoving that professor's face eventually onto that hot stove, oh, yeah. literally <laughs> charring also the, the fucking, entire yeah. bottom of his face. The ending of it where it's, well, that's just the thing. It's his what whole they show face. it, it's not as the bottom of his face. <laughs> the, 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 fully yeah, I was going to say, they actually show his whole face. face. His yeah. whole <laughs> face gets completely <laughs> melted off, like to, like to the bone, yes. like just completely But destroyed. in the wraparound story, yeah, and then he's it, only bandaged from like the nose down. With basically a bandana around the bottom of his face. <laughs> the bottom half. Yeah. yeah. It, it, the hard cut is very funny because they actually, and I'm pretty sure they do a hard cut from his burnt face to his. Yeah, they do, I think. So it's it's so like, it's okay, so you guys, obvious. you yeah. forgot half of that right there, but that's okay. It's um, so funny too because like the hospital scene would be, I, like I imagine the old, maybe one of the only reasons that they have him just show the top half of his face so you can identify that it's the same guy in the flashback, but like the right. hospital scene would be way better if he was fully bandaged. It would be so much scarier. It I mean, would. not that it's scary at all, but <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I agree that would have been better. But it's like they, it's like the guy that was the lead was like, no, you're not covering yeah, I'm all not of doing my that. face. I'm a star, <laughs> baby. I'm the star of Night of the Demon. <laughs> the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I am Michael Cut. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. Another thing that I, I wrote down about this that I feel like sums up, all of the, or not, it's just a funny thing. But uh, I watched this on Amazon Prime. 
Um, and like they had no, I wasn't even sure it was going to be the right movie because they didn't have a poster or like any image of it at all. It just said <laughs> Night of the Demon. And the in the description, like the, the you know, the main character's name is Professor Nugent. Uh, and the Amazon Prime description, he was, they just called him Professor Nugget. <laughs> <laughs> just this is a complete oh like falling through the cracks, nothing. Who, nobody, yeah, we don't even <laughs> yeah. care. Yeah, literally, yeah. yeah, this is the Amazon Prime description is just Professor Nugget and his students try to ta- track down Bigfoot, but end up uncovering something more sinister at work. <laughs> that's the only info what? you have about the movie at all. That's I, so I, well, I mean, good. I guess so. I, I mean, I guess the sex cult stuff and all yeah. that, but it, but they they do uncover Bigfoot. Yeah, and Bigfoot. It Bigfoot is the sex cult in Just, a way. Man, <laughs> Professor Nugget was making me laugh so much. Before <laughs> yes, I was like, "There's no way that he that's his name." <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then but, but, but hey, you can insane. you can get this in beautiful 1080p from uh, Severin, who released this on Blu-ray and apparently released it in a lovely set with all kinds of history for all fans of uh, <laughs> wonderful cult and art cinema. You yes, know? <laughs> and I do. We do have to include the the last detail where uh, they they deem him criminally insane and don't believe him about his Sasquatch story, and that's it. The Sasquatch yep. lives on to kill again. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Let's go. I wouldn't believe him either. To be fair. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. I didn't believe what I was watching. I exactly. Was watching it, so. Yeah. This whole thing was made up for sure. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the genius of the film. It's psychological. Yes. You, you wonder if it's all inside of professor Nugent's head. <laughs> True. Professor. I, I also head. have to wonder too, if there's any like Bigfoot heads that are like, well, Bigfoot wouldn't do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. That is a hundred percent propaganda. How, how yeah. that is, I, I guarantee you, if you look into this movie, you will find people saying that. That I went on a Bigfoot movie uh, kick like a, a few months ago, and oh, on yeah. every movie where Bigfoot just is like attacking people indiscriminately, there are people who are like, uh, "This is inaccurate." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did not hit. He's not uh, evil. Trees with he sticks doesn't do this. He, he's nice. he, he, he is a he, he is a sweet large boy. He's Which he's not right. dissimilar from the creature from the Black Lagoon. You know, he's <laughs> yeah. just you know. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's <laughs> just mean to him. <laughs> Bigfoot should be a romantic figure. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They they failed on. Where is on this sexy movie Bigfoot? <laughs> not really, not in the context honestly, of this movie. But really, where is like yeah. romantically sexy Bigfoot? I, I, I really, really agree with up them, romantic though. Bigfoot this time. <laughs> or I'm like, if you're gonna if you're gonna have like an an evil rape demon in the woods, like why make it Bigfoot? Why what yeah. is, what are we doing here? <laughs> what is some this, serious man? character assassination? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm like, it really it, reads actually. like they're like, we want to make a movie that's set in the woods in Northern California. What what monsters? are there oh bigfoot okay we'll yeah, call it this bigfoot. is anti sasquatch propaganda i don't yeah i don't like it but anymore. then they didn't even call it bigfoot though like how do you not I like can't i don't they know didn't just call it like night of the beast just night of the yeah, demon is hilarious because they're they really are just trying to get you into the seat like demons well, i read are cool, right? I, I think apparently it was originally called revenge of bigfoot okay well, okay shit, that would have been sweet i like that or uh, maybe I, I read i think i read that somewhere and they wanted to keep yeah. it more mysterious Except yeah. they don't, because Bigfoot like rips the dick <laughs> off in the first ten minutes of the movie or something. Yeah, just a lot of puzzling choices. I feel like. Oh yeah, James. Yeah, C. but I, but I will say, if we are pivoting towards reductive rating round, this was still a three for me. Maybe me too. And and at some point too, now that I know what it is, maybe it might even be a high three because I I got a lot of <laughs> entertainment out of this. I think yep. you have to be a specific kind of person to get <laughs> a lot of entertainment out of this. You have to be familiar. Oh yeah. I think with be a sleazy die cheap hard. movies with video nasties and slashers and because because it is it, it's bizarre and it's amusing but only in a way that like i feel like i could show this to someone else like a normal person and they would be like this what is torturous fuck? like why yeah. the how the fuck like it's so like just between the leisurely pace of it the porno dialogue the bizarre editing patterns the lack of tonal control like i'm describing a movie that i like um, right. <laughs> yeah. and, like and and it it is just because it it i don't know there is there is a weird kind of sleepy campfire uh atmosphere that it builds and and it builds to to its credit like some pretty shocking gore moments that i think work like and it has a lot of them and yeah, yeah. maybe it is all 
sort of cynically structured around this like <laughs> after the fact flashbacks you know um but the but the, the sequences themselves are ridiculously gruesome and and mean and, silly. and strange yeah. and G- girl scouts being rammed into each other till they stab each other to death <laughs> dicks being rammed off uh, ripped off and people just being like oh no you know, uh, you know the, the the sleeping bag twirling and, and impaling the fucking <laughs> intestines being pulled out like there's there is a lot of like really grisly you know sort of like slasher entertainment to get out of this even including the bizarre direction of some of the performances and the fucking screaming and the just the 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 the, the pacing of the entire thing and then just to also throw in one of the most unpleasant like <laughs> abuse melodramas i've ever seen in a movie just square in the middle of the movie like uh. it's a twist <laughs> and and I will be honest, I found that whole flashback like actually stomach churning oh, in yeah. some ways that I think are kind of indefensible. Like, again, I think that rape sequence is it's way actually too really ugly and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and kind of bad. Um, but I honestly think everything else about that sequence and the whole like, you know, it, I think Jamie was right that there it, it does get a little bit more visually um in intense as mm-hmm. the religious father is fucking you know wide angle shot of him holding the screaming fucking bigfoot fetus and the whole thing of the the daughter getting revenge by burning him alive and his hand melting so like you know like all of that stuff i think is unpleasant in a more defensible way and a more interesting way and in a way that i do think would just people tr- trying to watch a fun slasher would find upsetting and that's sort of interesting and i don't know if that's what they were going for but that's ultimately it's just like here's an entertaining slasher now feel horrible and then just in time to go back to like a almost accidental like art film, like Fulci Night of the Living Dead like style finale where Bigfoot just like viciously tears every single character apart. And, you know, and, and, and it almost feels like an afterthought that they made it so that there was like a survivor because a slasher film has to have a survivor. Otherwise, right. this would just be Bigfoot fucking brutally murdered everyone, everyone, you know, like that's how the sequence revenge. actually plays. And then they, you know, so I don't know. I was very, very strange. But as far as like, you know, again, they shot this in 1979. So you yeah. do have to consider this was prior to friday the 13th and the fact that one of the only real comparison points i have for what it's doing is something that didn't exist when they shot it there's Mm -hmm. some credit there they were a little bit ahead of their time on 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 some of this stuff and even if it's just a bunch of weird friends of a gay porn director who were just like let's make the fucking nastiest thing we can fucking think (laughs) of in 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 the six flags magic mountain um make all the straight sex completely boring fuck them (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then and then also throw in a weird like Bigfoot sex cult ritual fucking Hills Have Eyes meets Wicker Man shit in there as well, and <laughs> yeah. you know a bizarre movie and uh, absolutely worthy of, uh, in my opinion, of, of its place in the sort of like uh, bizarre B slasher kind of kind of canon. I totally get why this one has kind of uh, you know been cropping back up and has a nice fancy little Blu-ray release that people are enjoying. So yeah, I I, I will say. Despite the fact that everything about this movie says y- you shouldn't like this, <laughs> yeah, part of me yeah. was like, part of me well, too bad got I do. A, a, <laughs> kind, kind of appreciated it and on on some level. So yeah, yeah, it does. It's a lot of it feels like a a giant middle finger. It's just so tonally messy and um, like I, I will say, um, was was it Wasson or Wasson? I'm not sure, but Wasson is he's Wasson. Wasson. He's far from talentless. Like there's a lot of really interesting and and cool little sequences in this and and you know per, aside from the kind of disturbing elements of the the big flashback, there are a lot of interesting um, directing decisions he makes within that sequence that feel very on purpose compared to the rest of the film. So that was cool to see. Like the, he has ideas. They're just Yeah, completely- all the flashback murders are a little flat. They do feel Feel like a producer because he actually straight up says that the producer just shot the flashback stuff himself and yeah. just added it in after the fact and that but they also have like that amateur no budget charm too of just totally. like and like that mean. guy's dick getting ripped off yeah. and just like the shot of just his gushing lack of a penis wound just like launching fucking syrup everywhere <laughs> yeah yeah it's just that he lacks um he lacks focus and that's like 
where you just kind of get the silliest, messiest film that doesn't really say a lot. You're just kind of there to be entertained by Sasquatch killing people. Um, and like, and again, that that sequence with the sexual assault is is horrifying. But it did give me a moment with my with my brother where I'm we we kept the movie going, and he just had to go to the bathroom real quick. And it was right as soon as this started, so we didn't see it start. He comes in after he pees, and he just goes, "Is is Bigfoot sexually assaulting that woman?" And and it was like, <laughs> I've never heard that question. The words in that order were just so much for me at that time, and I just started howling. <laughs> like I, it was like I can't believe this movie has given. That is me the this experience of kind of brother. watching the movie. It, <laughs> is, am yeah. I actually seeing yeah, what's on screen? Yeah, he had, oh, to, yeah. Like, <laughs> he had to outwardly question what he was watching. So it was it was just a very funny moment, um, given that it was a very disturbing moment at the same time. But uh, but yeah, this is a this is a three. I think it's very entertaining um, for for good reasons and bad reasons. So the, it yeah. is what it is. Well, check this out. This for me is a three point five. Let's go! Oh shit! Uh, I I really liked this. Yeah, despite uh, I mean, it really did. I, I it made me feel like I was watching something that was just again. I I think all the comparisons you can make did come after it, which is so crazy. Like the main thing yeah. that it reminded me of is I don't know if you guys have seen uh, like Sledgehammer. Have you seen that movie? I don't think I have, actually. Uh, no, actually. Just very, yeah, very scuzzy, disgusting, uh, straight-to-video, 80s, you know, Halloween. Oh, Friday David A. Pryor, though. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah. about. Okay. Yeah. Or, like, also, like, uh, uh, Day of the Reaper is another one. But just, like, all, yeah, the, the, you know, the same that same vibe of just all the completely... You can't hear the dialogue because the synth is too <laughs> loud and they don't have they clearly don't have a mic that they're using when they're filming like there's just the sound is as hollow and tinny and everything. Everything is happening for no reason. And even the things that are supposed to not be gross are gross. Like just <laughs> everything is just kind of through a veil of nastiness and you just yeah you really I, I went into this pretty much blind um, and it really caught me off guard and the whole time I was kind of just like, I feel like if it had ended a different way, I would have liked it less, but the ending really just did seal the deal for me where that just slow motion mm -hmm. set piece into the just complete hand wave. Nothing ending is so <laughs> crazy. And just really, I was like, all right, yep, I'm sold. Uh, and I just, yeah, I like this type of thing a lot where you just, you know, if you, if you look away from the, if you like zone out during this movie for like more than two minutes, you are lost. <laughs> it's over <laughs> for you. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to rewind because I was like, who the fuck are these people that are getting killed right now? And like realized it was another flashback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, and, and, and yeah, and, and like the sleep, one thing that you won't remember, and I challenge anyone to, you know, like catch this on the first pass. The guy in the sleeping bag is not a flashback kill. <laughs> right, it is. Like, isn't that crazy? Dude, like, if, yeah, who yeah. is that guy? <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, you really just have to respect something that is. Yeah, again, just pure love of the game for for sleaze and scuzz and just doing it for basically no reason. Making a movie so nasty, you get it banned, and that no, you can't. Nobody who watches it can remember it without their mind sliding off of it. Like, you just yeah, you gotta love that Due to kind the of trauma thing. bestowed upon um, you. Yeah. And it just has, yeah, That's such a right. weird story of it getting made to of all that gore getting like added in afterwards. Just, yeah, very, very interesting, fun to watch if you're into that type of thing. Um, and it would be fun to show somebody who isn't into that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. I will definitely be showing this to someone and trying to catch some first time reactions <laughs> and just, <laughs> just enjoying the second hand, you know, yeah. aspect of that. Especially, yeah, really dude, I mean, especially I after my, my, my Bigfoot kick I went on earlier where I like I, I fell in love with you know have you guys seen uh the legend of boggy uh, creek is that it is it a creek or a mountain oh yeah the, uh, no but that that's been on my watch list that for one a is long so time. great Who yeah but, legend of again? boggy creek uh that is let's see here wasn't it he does a bunch uh, of charles, charles b, b pierce, pierce. Yes. oh yeah the guy who did uh town the dreaded sundown oh sick i didn't even realize that was the same guy but yeah legend of boggy creek is like super you know like gorgeous nature photography like some of the most beautiful nature photography i've seen and like just like slow and and nice and like thoughtful and 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 folky and this is just like so much on the opposite side of the spectrum it's <laughs> so that that would be a good double feature i would actually recommend that i feel like yeah. those two movies <laughs> together would be crazy 
Well, that, I think, will uh, wrap it up for uh, Night of the Demon, as well as this week's episode of Night of the Demon Times 2. Knights um, of the Demons. <laughs> Knights right. of the Demons. We we went wild with it. We talked about our hairy buddies. Um, <laughs> but that that is going to wrap it up for for this week. Thanks so much, uh, Cameron, for, for uh, coming back on and for bringing these films with you, getting us back in the monster zone. Um, what's going on in, uh, in, in Cameron's world right now? Uh, well, what do you got a plug. Do you bring anything with you? You going on tour or anything? Uh, no, any fun episodes coming out? Let's see. No tour, no tour yet, but it may be to keep your eyes Working open. On it? Uh, okay. and, right. uh, in terms of fun episodes, I mean, we'll be doing a bunch of Christmas stuff over a podcast about lists. Um, you can Ooh. check that out on YouTube or Spotify or wherever. Uh, Monster Crazy, we are, unfortunately, it is ending, but we have two more episodes left, and the next episode we're recording soon will be all about ghosts. So if you're a ghost nice. fan, which I imagine okay. that a lot of people listening to this are, check out Monster Crazy again on whatever Yeah, what's on, what's on, what's on the short list? Um, or did you, did you, did you, can you spoil it a little bit? Oh, yeah, I can tell you mind, for sure. You I definitely, will, I, and I'm sure that people who, who have listened to to the to monster crazy will know that we'll probably be talking about this i'm sure we will be having a long discussion about um about pulse kiyoshi kurosawa's Ooh, pulse oh, hell yeah yes. just kiyoshi kurosawa in general i feel like the weird like ashy little silhouettes yeah, and man. stuff like that i so know good. that i know turn of the screw is definitely going to be coming up too there's no question the innocence baby all timer yeah. all timer so good yeah oh my god <laughs> just all, all types of fun stuff um so let's go. Oh, and you know what? And I'm, I'll spoil this one too. I'm definitely know that I will also be talking about uh, Black Sabbath. Um, oh, hell the, yes. The, just the did seance that. awesome. or the medium segment in Black Sabbath. I, that's one of my Yeah, favorite yeah. We actually, we just did that and Creep Show as a pairing with uh, Rob Franco as our Halloween episode this year. But yeah, Black Sabbath, one of the best anthology horror films love just it. of all yeah. time. That's my, maybe my number one anthology segment is the drop of water. I love, oh, I love that. Yeah, so I much. love it, man. It's so, so fucking, good. That fucking dummy of that woman so in like the scary. fucking Argento lighting. <laughs> it's terrifying. So fucking good. I think about it all the time, to be honest, since we've, <laughs> since we covered it. Ugh. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, all ch- right. check all that stuff out and that's all I got. But thank you again, guys, for having me on. It's always a blast. Hell yeah, no man. Problem. Yeah, definitely go check all that out. For our listeners, we are going to be back in one week's time where uh, Jamie is correct. We are going to be <laughs> finally talking. Well, maybe not finally. It's not really the sleazy. I've <laughs> been waiting for We're it. We're going to be talking about a, a, a slightly more sadistic movie than I think it has the reputation of having. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about Willy Wonka uh, because there <laughs> oh, is a yeah. new, uh, probably shitty, but I'm <laughs> open to it not being uh, Willy Wonka. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a like remake a prequel or a prequel. Or it's, it's a prequel, prequel. or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know, really, but. I mean, it's uh, critics are going nuts because it's the Paddington guy. I'm a little concerned because that script was one like one of the early blacklist scripts where <laughs> the whole idea was like ed, ed, edgy Wonka is awful script. So I don't know how many times <laughs> that's been rewritten. We'll see. But we're going to talk about it because I actually do find that movie like a little bit sort of like how I find like early Disney stuff, like just a little bit more dark and weird yeah. than the actual like the, than the sweet kind of surfaces of the movie itself and the sort of musical production of yeah. it. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that. Movie. I, I, for, it I rewatched I, it like a, a year or two ago and I was like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. Me too. Yeah. I watched it just last year because the 4K Blu-ray came out. So I was like, I need to see what that those colors look like. Yeah, set and, design yeah, specifically in that movie is just unbelievable. <laughs> blown away so we're gonna talk about that and we were trying to think of a pairing to do and i kind of just kind of got, I, I got bored i was much like fine we'll just do roll doll we'll do it uh and and i did <laughs> rewatch this recently and i kind of am interested in talking about it uh we're gonna talk about matilda oh hell it's yeah a, d- 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 i never danny, thought we danny would be d- talking about matilda on this show <laughs> but it, it, you know what we're, we're, we're gonna do it because Holy danny shit. devito hiring tim burton's cinematographer really shows in that film so i'm i'm very interested in in uh, uh, talking about that and 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 it's more it's more fuck them kids from Roald Dahl you know it is. and you know, honestly, we're, we're gonna get a, I've always been kind of a fan of Matilda it does have some very like really gross close ups and direction that really accentuates kind of the like like the cake eating scene for instance if anyone sees yeah. that's right also that I is, do, we're gonna talk about the cinematic sure. prowess yeah. of Danny DeVito yeah and week. I and I did I did mention I think when we were doing L A Confidential that um. It was like because he was narrating in it, and I think he narrates in the <laughs> right, too. Yeah. yeah, just all the connections, baby. It's happening. Lots of connections. <laughs> so yeah, Willy Wonka, Matilda next week over on the Patreon exclusively, and then in two weeks' time, we're going to be back with a uh, special guest, and we are going to be for the first time, I think, on this show talking about Albert Brooks. Sweet. 
the uh, legendary uh, 70s and, and, and 80s American comedian. And we're going to be talking about uh, two of his films that I like a lot. We're going to be talking about uh, Real Life, which is his like um, meta sort of like filmmaking. It's, it's almost like a little bit of like a parody of that uh, PBS series, An American Family. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very, very strange movie, uh, very self-reflexive. And then we're going to be pairing that with his 90s, a little bit more of like a feel good, almost like rom-com fantasy film, uh, Defending Your Life, which is uh uh, actually, a really beautiful film with him and Meryl Streep and uh, mm. and and Rip Torn. Which, if if no one has uh, seen that, I'm excited for people to check it out because I think Criterion recently put it out. And it, I I remember bringing it up early in the year because Bo is Afraid made me think about it because oh. that whole bit at the end of Bo is Afraid when they're doing the he has to defend his whole life in like <laughs> uh you know decisions he made like when he was a kid but in like a lawyer context yeah. at the end of Bo is Afraid it literally ripped from defending your life. Like Ari Aster has admitted he stole that. Cause that's the concept of defending your life. Oh, okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah, is is, is, is what if you die and rip torn is your lawyer. And <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so either way, Albert Brooks, we're, we're going a little bit more sweet with it. I wouldn't really describe Albert Brooks as a sleazy filmmaker. The sleaziest he ever got was playing the Jewish gangster in drive. Probably. Yeah. But I'm, I, or, and, and, and I guess his side role in taxi driver too. You could claim a little bit, yeah. but uh, it is Christmas. I am, I I am excited. We'll go a little sweet mode for the, for the <laughs> we're going a little sweeter with it. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to talk about uh, Albert Brooks finally too. broadcast news is like just one of my favorite movies. So I'm excited Hell to yeah. talk about him. But uh, yeah, that uh, will wrap it up for everything this week. Thanks so much for listening and keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy, y'all.